Blockbusters, the show where we treat the final edit of a movie like the script. I'm one of your hosts, Bob Rose, and with me is two other guys who are going to introduce themselves. I am Jimmy George. I am a screenwriter and script consultant. My Twitter handle is at Jimmy R. George. And I am Jamie Nash. I'm a screenwriter and the writer of Save the Cat Writes for TV. And my Twitter handle is Jamie underscore Nash. And my Twitter handle is at ThunderGruntBob, and today we're going to talk about everything, everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, so, but before we get into the script topics, we're going to talk about all of our personal thoughts on the movie, and because it is one Sir Jimmy George's birthday, happy birthday, <laughs> Jimmy. I say that Jimmy should go first. He should have the honor of leading us off. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. Um, Happy uh, yeah. 30th birthday. Yeah, right. <laughs> 29th I'm, birthday. I'm 42. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, I, I love that I'm doing this. That this is your this hitchhiker birthday. birthday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, what does I, that mean? Like he's Rutger Hauer? Or, no, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, oh, 42. The meaning of the universe. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I, Which is referenced I, in this movie, by the way. Yeah. I, I guess um, I guess he's not the hitch. He's the hitcher, not the hitchhiker. Yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah. Like, what? You can have a Rucker Howard birthday. That's fine, too. If you, it's your birthday. Is, it, is there a difference between a hitcher and a hitchhiker? Is that a thing? Is there a hitcher? No, they're the same. I, they're the same. I, they mean the same thing. A hitcher sounds like somebody that puts like a trailer on the back of your truck. Right. <laughs> We need a hitcher over here. Um, I have a reboot idea for the hitcher. <laughs> they already rebooted the hitcher, man. Oh, Sean, yeah, that's Sean right. Bean. I forgot. <laughs> you it missed an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, so I'll tell you what I thought about the movie. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Um, tell us what you thought. Yes. Uh, so I love this movie. I've been looking forward. We've been talking, trying to find the right date to talk about this. And, uh, we're finally getting to do it. And it's a really difficult movie to break down. I think just because there's so much happening everywhere all at once. Um, but uh, I love the movie and uh, my only disconnect with it is I have like some deep seated programming about nihilism, which we're going to talk about later. And so I feel all the emotions the movie wants me to feel um, I love I love the ending. I love what they're trying to say. I just don't I'm not on board with positive nihilism. So that's not to not speaking to the merits of the movie, just to my own personal preference. Like I can't get on board with positive nihilism. So other than that, like, yeah, I loved it. So a plus a false theme, a false theme <laughs> alert. That's that's like the moral the moral premise, which we talk about a lot. They have like a whole thing where nihil nihilistic movies never make money and this one actually made a ton of money so or never you know Take never that. big hits yeah yes. this is the this is the you know this one literally set out to be like we're gonna be hopeful nihilistically oh they're calling me <laughs> uh they're calling me now to say don't say that on the air don't say that stop it don't give away the secrets <laughs> um jamie go for it I'm or listening he's... to who I hope I hope whoever that was nobody can call them I think it's a sales call it's going off <laughs> in the background <laughs> I'm not editing this out either this just stays it's, in it's weird too it's like giving me this whole thing like uh, the caller that's calling four six seven two three I would say the whole thing but it just keeps giving <laughs> no, the you number. should it's everything um, everywhere all at once yeah, right it's a sales call why should I care <laughs> um so yeah no I I really, you know, I really love this movie. It's kind of the type of movie that I used to, I used to always want to make. Um, now, here's the weird thing. I do have my problems with it. They're not Jimmy's problems. I actually, for whatever reason, 
the middle sometimes gets a little draggy for me, um, mm-hmm. as we'll talk about in a little bit. But then the yen wins me over. So I love the min- I love the beginning. I think the middle gets a little draggy, and then I love the end kind of message of it. Um, but overall, I mean, a movie like no other at the theater you'll see this year. Um, a movie that's really hard to compare. I mean, you have some obvious <laughs> yeah. comparisons to like The Matrix or you know something like that if you want to try to do a comparison. But um, just between the way it's told, what it's telling, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a unique experience which we really don't get that often anymore yeah i can see why it's so celebrated is because you're going in and you're going to see something you really haven't quite seen before okay yeah um i'll try to make mine short uh so i've been a big fan of the daniels or mine i there's nothing i'm not going to say about this movie that anyone hasn't heard i absolutely love it it's probably it's like I consider it a masterpiece, so I'm coming from that angle. This whole episode, everybody know that. But there's two there's two points about it that make me love it extra hard. Uh, one is that Daniel Kwan publicly talked on Twitter about how he's always felt guilty for being a maximalist filmmaker, as in like like you know if you guys know what a minimalist film maker is or a minimalist film is, it's like uh, Clerks or probably some kind of you know any any movie that isn't much on style and it's mostly talking and mostly just you know dog dogma 93 or what was it called dogma 90 something i don't know i know you remember that about. yes yeah. some, something like that that is a minimalist or film. mumblecore mm-hmm. mumblecore is our minimalist film stuff that's usually more celebrated by the uh, artistic community Daniel Kwan has he was talking about how he is a maximalist filmmaker and he's always felt kind of guilty and like he should be kind of ashamed about it and reading all that and then seeing this movie I was like it touched me in a way that I haven't been in a while from just reading stuff by filmmakers in general because if you've ever seen anything I've made I kind of try to reach for that I love like making things that are maximalist like all style extremely fast extremely heavy on a lot of premises uh and like where editing is key on everything yeah. like, this movie's one right. of the best edited movies i've ever seen you know I, so yeah I, I i would even say that this movie not to interrupt your your yeah, yeah. thoughts on the masterpiece but that's the one thing i like i remember when i was a kid in the 80s and they started to say you know movies have transitioned to the mtv generation you right. know and they and they were talking about like top gun and stuff cuz they were they were yeah, edited tony faster scott. tony scott tony scott and yeah, yeah. and they had music and stuff like that this movie you know i can't think of too many movies that feel like like youtube influenced in some ways well, or that, something like that's exactly you, where i was going to get to because yeah, like yeah cuz this one that feels are, like it they're not only music video directors, they're kind of mavericks in their own way. Like the fact that all the effects and stuff were done by six dudes, you know, like, and they're not, they're kind of all people that I can identify with and stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah. The movie feels very homemade in a way that's very close to my heart. And him talking about be- feeling like uh, kind of out of place in the filmmaking community for wanting to make movies mm. like this really touching to me. Second, and like you said, I'm going to say this because you're talking about the positive nihilism, so it's kind of your own personal experience. Secondly, um, just the fact that it brought back Kihai Kwan, just the fact that that, like, like I know that that's a weird thing to say, but, like, he was, I can't stress enough, I got a poster of him on my door of Short Round, because I can't stress enough how much Short Round actually means to me in my life. Like, he was one of my heroes as a kid. I love Short Round. I have an emotional connection to, to that movie. Jamie knows because I think it's one of the first things we argued about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think he sucks. I know. No, I, that's, no, that's, not the, that's not But I, I have an emotional connection to Short Round in my, like, in my cinematic life. And the fact that this is this extremely uh, this movie that's extremely made for me is also the return of Kihai Kwan is it, I don't know yeah. made it it made a movie that I would have teared up at even like you know, like ten times more emotional especially because of the character he plays and everything mm-hmm. too so 
when I so like there, I I don't know. This movie is very special to me in a way that <clears throat> exceed that extends beyond just how awesome it's made. So those that's are the awesome. two. Those that's the two things: the maximalism and the and the short round of it all. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I really love this movie though. I've seen it. I've seen it like six times, and probably even more than that if you count like watching breakdowns and stuff on YouTube. Right. Kind of yeah. yeah. So yeah. big fan. So take that. So this is all. This is a love fest, basically. Well, Jamie um, hates the middle. Jamie in the so. middle. We'll we'll get there. But I, you know, <laughs> Bob, Bob gets a little draggy. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. totally kidding. I, it's Bob, uh, yeah. yeah, people out there, you're the middle section of your podcast is the same it way. Sucks too, man. Um, you yeah, I forward show. to the end when you're just saying goodbye. <laughs> um, the uh, so this isn't on the talking points, but you brought up a really interesting thing that they said in the commentary because I listened to the commentary last night mm -hmm. about the maximalism. Yeah. So um, they said that when they were taught screenwriting, one of the like tenant rules, quote unquote, that they were taught. And I've never heard this before. Um, so this was interesting um they, i think they took my class though they took your class <laughs> you did a good job jamie <laughs> but uh was that you should write an emotional scale on every scene and you should know um between one and ten uh where whether like the intensity of the emotions that the audience is feeling and they were told you should never have like two scenes back to back that are tens or you should always try to balance it out. Have a five, then a seven, then a nine, then a five, you know, these things. Um, and I personally, when I was learning how to write um, and I first started sending my stuff out to consultants to try to like learn the craft and stuff, that was something I heard over and over. I was trying to like just fill it with ideas and fill it with like lots of crazy emotionally you know, heavy stuff happening pay, scene after scene. Cause that's, I thought that was a good way to tell a story. And I was told over and over that this is, this is too much, you know, like, and like, it's too emotional. It's too, it, it basically another version of that. The, the note I kept getting was it's steroids. It's a movie on steroids, which I was like, okay, I guess I have to tone that down. So um, that frustration I can relate to, and it was inspiring to hear them say, like, we intentionally set out to make this a 10 in every scene. We we were like, we're going to make a movie that's a 10 on the emotional intensity scale from fade in to fade out on purpose. So I thought that right. was I loved that quote. I had never I, I it's kind of inspiring to see, like, if you take the right approach, you can make that work. So, yeah. Yeah. Jamie, yeah. have you heard anything like that before? No. No. no, I mean, I was trying to figure out like what that was a, you know, kind of adaptation from. And the only closest thing I was getting to was like the McGee value change or something. Yeah, like, no, no. Know, also, you have that, to go an escalation to a de escalation or something. Yeah, like, I've never know. heard that numerical I, I scale say. they were talking about. Yeah. That feels no. also like information or a lesson. I mean, I, I refer to you guys when it comes to teaching this stuff, but that also feels like a lesson from like 10 or more years ago. Like mm -hmm. now, movies right? Are, exactly. Now movies are competing with TikTok and TikTok internet and, and YouTube yeah. and everything. Right. Like it's just why wouldn't yeah. you go to ten constantly to keep if up? You with can, and, and yeah. If you can, and if you can, and it and it works, and it works, um, sure. Yeah, but, I mean they have quality control, as we'll talk about when we compare. We're going to compare the drafts later. Well, but um, they have a, was, they have a really good sense of their own quality control, so. I was going to say before we got into it, like the one thing I remember watching an interview with the two of them where they said uh, they did spend six years on the script mm -hmm. and they, wow. both, right. They spent six years on it and they, they really like said that they like failed at it so many times, mm -hmm. but they were also pretty much like when somebody asked them at the screening, cause I was watching a video of a screening Q and a, and somebody asked like, when's your next movie? And they were like, probably six or more years. Wow. Like, so these guys are not, I don't know, they're unconventional in that, like, what well, Swiss Army Man was about that long ago, too. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not going to pump out movies. They're, like, going to, like, spend very meticulous amounts of time 
to make sure when they come out with something this ma- this is this is insane. At least so they're a quality it. over quantity created. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me tell you what that really is. That's code word for we have three TV shows in development. That's all it is. <laughs> Jamie knows. Jamie's probably had j- meetings with them, and he's he's not even yeah, telling us. He's yeah, got they... he's had to sign NDAs. You know, ja- Jamie loves turn down for what the music video. That that's my favorite video of all time. It is. It is. <laughs> No, Daniel I just Kwan, the, Daniel Kwan is the guy fucking the TV in them in that you know that <laughs> I didn't that's know amazing. that didn't yeah know that's that. him uh, yeah and real quick if you ever want to see one of my favorite short films of all time they that they did which I think is like the prequel to everything everywhere all at once pretty much is called interesting ball it's on Vimeo it's like they've even said it's kind of the prequel tonally to everything you know so awesome. check that out it's an awesome short you know, I wouldn't. It's not for a script podcast. It's not that kind of short, <laughs> but uh, it's really just an amazing little piece of uh, short filmmaking. Anyway, uh, Jamie, yes, who wrote this shit? We already answered. This question, but go ahead and say it. Yes, this was written. It's funny because I flipped over to see what else short round has been in, and now I've lost my page. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, like what his gap was. Uh, I, I don't even remember his run on head of the class, but I guess I kind of do now that they say it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so a whole show about, about, about that yeah. and why he left yeah. and why he came back. It's very emotional. Mm-hmm. Actually. Well, it seems like he's poised for a, I'm trying to think who's the kid from bad news bears that had a run for a brief period of time. Jack Earl. Jack Earl Haley. Yeah. Yeah. feels like he's, He's going to hit that mark where he's going to do like five cool things, like the coolest things all in the yeah, next yeah. two years or something. Because I think he's in Loki now. and yeah, Good yeah. for him. Might, might have been announced something else that he was doing. And of course, he's going to appear in the Indiana Jones movie. And we all know. You think? No, you I think that no, they have I, to like. I, I, I'm just kidding. I don't know. They really have to like it. film that and add it somehow because <laughs> I don't think they were expecting this movie to be anything. They yeah. said they're going to. They're they because they're doing the whole de aging thing with Indiana Jones, so they'll probably de age short round as well and have their origin story. <laughs> and they'll that's, do forced perspective like a, to make them smaller. Make them smaller. <laughs> hey, if they could de age your face, they can make you a little no, man, smaller. I want, I want a short round as an adult movie. Yes. He should be the next Indiana Jones. I've said one hundred percent years. I've said this. Uh, no one. I'm I'm yes. on board. Yes. Many people believe Give. the same thing. It is yes. He's he can obviously do it anyway. I, Jamie, I want sorry. the I want the mutt short round team up movie. Stop this it. is this Nobody is an everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> Nobody <wants> podcast. <laughs> everybody about, wants everybody wants the mutt. Ball. Yeah, everybody wants the mutt short round uh, team up. Come on, man. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the mutt <laughs> mutt mutt. The, so, so the writers of this movie are Dan Kwan and Daniel. Is it Shinert? Shinert, yeah. Shinert. It's funny that Dan Kwan's isn't Daniel on the on IMDb because they're the Dan- Daniels is the name of their duo. Yeah, yeah. And, and as in this movie, he's credited as Daniel Kwan. It's yeah, just yeah. They, that's his official IMDb name. So, yeah. but they are known collectively as the Daniels. The Daniels. No, no, the oh, just as, Daniels. As Daniels. Daniels. Yeah. So it sounds Sorry. Weird. very yeah. important. Dan- it's, it does Daniel sound Brothers, weirder, though. <laughs> Daniels, 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 son, something like that. Yeah, and they're that's and a they, different movie. I guess until now they are pretty much the Swiss Army Man guys, or or the yeah. turn down for what guys, right, right, right. I mean that's pretty much their biggest claim to fame. Mm-hmm. I'm looking here, mm-hmm. yeah. And then Jeff Daniels sometimes writes with them too. <laughs> the third, <laughs> the third, <laughs> the third, the third Daniel, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But he's uh, actually a Daniels oh as opposed to a Daniel. <laughs> what? So that's now, a Daniels. Is... Now he must be the lead in their next movie. Right. Yes. <laughs> What's the what was the box office on this? Because it is it the is box a pandemic office... release. So mm-hmm. it is just shy of one hundred million dollars. Wow. According to this. Uh its worldwide gross is ninety seven million dollars is that right is that true let me th- let me take one more the last look at something i i thought it made more than that is why but i'm looking at yeah. imdb right now um because as the u.s at 69 
you know, almost 70 million. So that means worldwide it only grows 27. I kind of would have thought this movie would have done a little better. Yeah. What maybe it hasn't hit all the territories. It might not mm. have, yeah. You know. Um they do say comedy doesn't travel and stuff, but this somehow feels more international. Yeah, yeah. You know, than um, and not just because of the leads and stuff, which I would think would help. Um, but I don't know. I, I thought it for some reason I had in my head that it was more like 150 yes. or something right, or right. 140. Um, um, just to double what, check too, well, I looked on yeah. Deadline and it is A24's highest grossing movie at the global box office ever. I just wanted to double check awesome. that fact. Yes, yes. What and and we were talking before the show, but probably it's also biggest budget at twenty five million dollars, oh. uh, which is a lot of money for an A twenty four movie. Yeah, right. right. I think I, I'm 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 scanning across like I'm trusting the movies that, right now. I don't now. actually know how much yes. their what their average budget is, but you're I, right. That seems. High. It seems like their movies are under ten for the most part. Uh, what, was mid- what was the budget of like Midsommar? That that was probably like a five to ten tops. It wasn't wow. that much. Yeah, that nine, was a cheap nine movie. million. They really made that. That was a nine million Oof. budget. Yeah, yeah. The um, sets. They A twenty four did produce one of my favorite comedy specials. <laughs> Anthony Jeselnik, Fire in the Maternity Ward. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big the, Anthony how, Jeselnik fan. How many millions of dollars uh, did that take? Though? Pro- less than 10, one. Ten million dollars. Ten million for, dollars for that. You know, to record a guy talking on stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Mid- Midsommar is nine million. That I would say that's closer to maybe their average. At their at their t- the tippy top. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, every so everything everywhere is probably one of their highest. But it also made the money, so I guess it was a good gamble. Yeah. Um and that's all considering, you know, what 2022 money? Yeah, right. Things I I remember goes going to see it and like stuff was still pretty bad. It's still I mean, it still is, mm-hmm. but, you know, it still had like the stink of covid on it. Mm-hmm. Um well, let's talk about it. Uh, yeah. The multiverse. Yes, Jamie. I felt like when I was watching this, this was a great example of the claiming mental real estate uh, technique that you've talked about in the past. You want to talk mm-hmm. about that? And I've got some quotes that sort of inform how they tapped into it. So first, if you want to explain yeah, sure. that. Yeah. Sure thing. Sure thing. Uh, so mental real estate is a is a word or a piece of jargon introduced by terry rossio and or and or ted elliott i think it was terry though on the wordplayer.com website a a old website it looks like it it was made in 1995 i think it was the way it was and they left it the way it was it looks like a space jam website yeah it has a ton of great columns really long in-depth columns and one of them is mental real estate and the idea about mental real estate it's kind of just claiming it, it's it's weird to it's hard to like say without claiming a concept an arena a world mm-hmm. of something as and and being like we made this and now every other movie that makes something similar will be compared to this mm-hmm. so the one i give an example just cuz to me if i said you know dinosaur movie what would be the first thing you came up right with? It, it would be Park, we're, right? we're back a dinosaur story of course yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say is it what's the one like pam and the dinosaur or something i was trying uh, to come tammy up with that T-Rex. tammy and, tammy the, and T-Rex. the t-rex T-Rex. that was yes. the one i wanted about, to say how about, but I how about carnosaur carnosaur, or, carnosaur. <laughs> or if you said um killer shark movie you know something yeah. like that right you claim that mental you're the first one out nobody's really claimed it yet and sometimes you're not even the first one out sometimes there's another you know sometimes there's johnny mnemonic and then you do the mm-hmm. matrix and you kind of mm-hmm. and it exactly it. and yeah. that's why i thought it was an interesting example because the multiverse now we've been conditioned even though it's been in comics and storytelling in general forever they even taught when they were on the commentary they were talking about how they consider um it's a wonderful life the first multiverse movie um, so that movie's 75 years old. Um, but uh, kind of it's all it's inspiring that you can say, well, everybody knows what the multiverse is. The multiverse is done, you know, uh, and 
come in and reclaim that mental real estate. And that's kind of what I was thinking this movie did. Would you agree? Am I using that right? Yeah, I mean, it, I would agree. I feel but, like no one's going to think of the multiverse my, my now only, without this movie. My only thing, I think, I think when people say the multiverse, they'll think of that Spider-Man movie. So mm. you know what's weird too is like the, the, what I think of this is terrible. What I think of what I think of Molly's originally was Jet Li's the one. Yeah, if mm. you remember that movie, because yeah, I, I thought that was kind of the big action I, movie, uh, multiverse introduction for me at least. And and Kihai Kwan was a stunt coordinator on that movie. That's which I got <laughs> oh. yesterday, which is awesome. Anyway, good. I think it's funny when I think of the multiverse. The first, it depends on the genre in some ways because it's right, used right. differently. Like in some ways, I think a fringe uh, as, as the multiverse. Oh, yeah, the yeah, fringe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that's the first one that pops in my mind because a lot of people have done that horror where it's only like one multiverse. Like you mm -hmm. only have you don't have ten right. of them. Right. Right. Uh, uh, but yeah, I I don't know. I think it's and I think I saw an interview where they said they saw. Um, What's what was the animated Spider Man into the Spider Verse or yes. whatever? Yeah. Um, they saw that they were like, "Oh no, we've lost." Yeah. They, so even they kind of looked at it and said, "We've lost it," you know. Yeah. But, but I actually think it's that just because of box office and just because of how mega popular it was, I think people will when they think of multiverse. If I ask the the average person, they will say that Spider Man movie. This this is less of a screenwriting debate, more just like a goofball. It's a more popular culture word. debate. Like, and yeah. when this came out, this literally was like he butting heads with uh, Doctor Strange, right? And then, right, you know, and even then, Jamie Lee Curtis was publicly trying to shame Doctor Strange <laughs> in some sort of weird culture war against it, and. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, so terrible. I mean, it's it's worth talking about because yeah. it actually does affect how people view it and how people mm -hmm. view the writing, because right? A lot because a lot of people aren't coming from it from our perspective. Where Jimmy has watched, and you know, you watch the commentary and you listen to a script podcast, and I've watched all this other stuff and seen like most people. Don't but they don't have that context, right? right? So most people think like these guys just like saw Marvel and they said we're going to do an art version of that. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So there it's so that has to hold up through that veil. Right. With the normal person. You have when you make that choice, there has to and so so this is a great segue into this. This is a really long quote, and I promise the other yep. ones are not this long that I'm gonna use. Sure. Yeah. But they sort of spoke about why they chose because I I would call this a gimmick. I would call the multi multiverse a gimmick, just like time travel, mm -hmm. I would call a gimmick. Right. Um they they had a specific reason for choosing this gimmick because of the, sto the, the story they wanted to tell and the theme. So uh, I don't know which Daniel said this. Um, I, 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 sorry. They are one. <laughs> they are. The, this is from Daniels. Daniels. Daniels said it. <laughs> All these quotes this, are from Daniels. This was from Jeff. Jeff, Dan <laughs> Jeff Daniels said this. Um, so uh, he, they said, we have infinite imaginations as humans. Our brains are built to be calculating different narratives, and yet we're trapped in these very limited bodies. And how frustrating that is as a living person who has to move around in one physical space knowing this is all we get. How scary it is to be trapped in this one existence knowing that your imagination wants to be going in every other direction. That tension has frustrated humans ever since our brains evolved to dream and make believe. Uh, that tension has only accelerated because of the internet. Now, not only do we have our own imaginations to contend with, we have the imaginations of everyone on the internet all the time. We're seeing infinite stories happening all at once, and you cannot help but imagine if you went another direction. The internet has made that, has made all the different lives we could have lived more palpable. Um, and then they said one more thing before we go into the next topic. They said, so we asked, how can we use cinematic language to translate that? Can we use the tools of genre to create the emotional and tonal whiplash of what it feels like to live in the world today? And instead of making that experience, that experience unpleasant like it is in reality, can we make something meaningful out of that? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that informs, like, how can you not use the multiverse gimmick when that's the story you're trying to tell, you know? So right. I think it's it speaks... <laughs> It's not yeah. them trying to have cameos. Right. <laughs> Which I, right. I'm not saying I don't like that, but it, you know what I mean? It's a, it's an example of like choosing a gimmick that 
that has purpose, purpose beyond just the gimmick. Yeah. If it, if if you, I view this a lot as a story of regret, like life regrets, and to tell that with a person being able to see other timelines, it is story relevant. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's it's making those imagined uh, lives we could have choose or choose real in some ways, so we right. can mm -hmm. flash back to them and actually see them play out. You, you know what else about this that's interesting conceptually? This is a a big world, a uh, little window story, even yeah. though it seems really big, but much like Terminator or something. It's very much like Terminator in that Terminator has this huge battle and war that mm -hmm. we always wanted to see, but they never seem to decide to show us that in the movies too much except for one movie or something but then we usually movie. just yeah and, and it actually is like the worst one um <laughs> but then but then we only get the glimpse of it in our world with like you know a, kind of a low budget kind of feel for it of a killer coming after a person i mean not the terminator 2 doesn't blow that up and stuff but terminator 1 that that's kind of what this movie does too like would this be your first instinct if I said go write a multiverse movie? Would it be this where people are almost possessed with the skills and would it souls take of other place people in an IRS office? Mostly, <laughs> right. probably not. I would not have. Probably I would not. not have assumed that. Yeah, yeah. It, you you probably would have people jumping to multiverses like Doctor Strange or something, even though he only jumped to like two. But yeah, Jamie, whatever. do you want to explain the for for somebody who's never heard us talk about the off screen movie? Because I thought about putting it on the talking points, and now you're talking about it. So you want to explain the concept of yeah. the off screen movie and big big world small window? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, there's. So the off-screen movie is it's another Terry Rossio thing. This will be a theme today. Uh we'll just talk about all <laughs> well, his things. Terry Rossio. Um and uh he, small soldiers, so he talks about an off-screen movie. And it, it basically the idea is that there's another there are other movies, or you know, it's very multiverse centered in some ways. <laughs> there are other movies going on while we're watching your movie. And there's like scenes that we're not seeing and things like that. And he actually kind of came to the conclusion that if your movie or your story doesn't have like a really spectacular or interesting off-screen movie, then your movie's probably boring. Um, so one very small example that I like because just it's it's one of you know the movies that made me want to make movies and one of the lines that wanted me made me want to make movies is the Clone Wars. You know, like you know. My father fought in the Clone Wars, and we knew nothing about it. We didn't have all these prequels. This is for old people. Uh, you obviously know what happened in the Clone Wars now. <laughs> when I was a kid, for the rest of my existence until the 1990s when they decided to make movies about this, um, I imagined what the Clone Wars even meant. It, it didn't mean anything. So that that's an example. <laughs> yeah, that's an example of throwing. So that's kind of a world building example of yeah. off screen movie. Right, right. But there, but there are other ones like that. Terry talks about like in a war movie. There's a whole war going on around them. You know, there's politics and conquering and all this stuff. But we're focused on like a little squad or something that's actually uh, fighting. And a big now the big big idea little window idea is something I think is very useful to writers spec writers because you could have all these huge ideas you could talk about multiverses you could talk about battles of the robots versus the machines but if you can give it to us in such a way that we can shoot it in an irs building then you're on to something mm -hmm. that that might actually get made as opposed to give us the huge game of thrones level of epic or whatever you're gonna do so yeah, they're, like they're kind for, of I'll give you a client example of the opposite. And this client, I've talked to her at length, uh, so I don't feel bad uh, talking about it on the podcast. Um, uh, of a big world, big window problem, which is something I see a lot, which is so this was a script that had seven warring factions on seven different countries. Um, there were four different major bodies of water there were like 20 different warships um and each of those seven warring factions had their own uh you know leadership hierarchy with their own internal problems on right. the team and then some of the seven were allies with some of the three 
So they basically were trying to tell a Game of Thrones level story in one script. And then the audience can't can't absorb all that information, um, despite how much the audience gets to absorb in this movie and, and it proving that they can absorb quite a lot of information. They can't keep up with seven warring factions and 81 speaking roles and things like that. So that that small window is like a crucial part of creating your world. Like what is the window that you're going to, that we're going to see. Right. And this was, I mean, yeah, you, this is through a family, right? Yeah. I mean, you get yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. of win- small windows into the other, and the other Evelyn's, self, right? but they're really small. They're really small glimpses. We're not seeing all of Evelyn's life in all of these other things. We're just and seeing you, enough that she can learn their skill. You could argue the same thing for uh, Into the Spider-Verse too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same type of deal. Yeah. Very, very much. Right. Um. Yeah, this is uh, the next point. What's a better movie to talk about tonal whiplash? <laughs> that's the term. Movie, I yeah. got that term from them. So yeah, that's bro, what they really? called this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Daniels <laughs> called this movie tonal whiplash. <laughs> so Jamie, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, we always talk about on this show, if you've been a listener or if you haven't, we always talked about the tonometer thing. And I believe mm-hmm. J- Jamie's Batman example is always my favorite. Uh, if, yeah, Jamie, do you want, to, want to do the tonometer, tonometer, and then yeah, we'll... it's and it's very similar to what you you heard uh, Jimmy talk that they said they did scene to scene or were told to do scene to scene, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, but basically it's just to kind of give yourself a little meter of 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 what your tone is for your overall movie. And um, my recommendation, because tone is really hard, especially when you're dealing with mm-hmm. co writers. So and. And Daniel's situation, it would be super important, even though I think they both totally get each other by now. Um, But uh, if you're dealing with a co-writer or a director or something like that, I think it's good to establish a tone meter using movie examples. And the reason we always say Batman is a good example is because there's so many Batman movies with so many different tones. Uh, And that's why it's a great example. So you could say like, I, and I probably change this every time we talk about it because yeah. I don't really have a fixed example. It's still a good example regardless yeah. if you change. But let's just say one, level one is is something like Lego Batman or something that's all about silliness and jokes and, and, and something like that. And then level 10 might be the recent The Batman or the Nolan movies. That's the serious side. And then somewhere in the middle, you might have Tim Burton's as a mm-hmm. six or five or something. Mm-hmm. And then below that, you might have... Uh, uh, Adam Schumacher, West Batman yeah. or something or Joel Schumacher which would be a three or a four so it just gives you a range and then you could say you know what I'm looking at this tonal meter Um, you know you could get similar movies maybe similar genre movies maybe in this case similar multiverse movies or something yep. like that and yeah, then you, you could would say take, make a master list of multiverse movies yeah and then yeah. you just say I'm around the five or six and then and then your question as you write is you can you could challenge you could say would this would this crazy scene where people are, you know, have to stick things up their butt to, to become no karate or something, would that make sense in Jet Li's Hero, or would it make sense in I don't know, I'm trying what's what's a martial arts movie that's silly, uh, uh, Kung Fu Sha- Hustle, Shaolin Soccer, Kung Fu Hustle. That was the one I was trying to think of, but yeah. I couldn't think of it. Um, yeah, would that make sense? And it would, probably wouldn't make sense in Kung Fu Hustle, but there's probably a version, some movie that is out there that might fit on that yeah, tonal this scale movie sort of changes batman movies mid-scene sometimes mm-hmm. yeah it does <laughs> and know? that's where the tonal whiplash comes from right? yeah. yes yeah so so I, first i kind of wanted to piggyback off of what you just said i think a great strategy going in because often what 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 i ask when a script isn't working I, I will I always wait to ask this question until after I've read the script because I don't I like to go into scripts cold um, so that I don't have just like you said, Bob, we don't have all the Daniels insight when we watch the movie. Right, right. To we'll help us, for a normal you know, person. so I, I like to go into when someone sends me a script, I like to go in cold. So I have nothing to go off of except what an audience member would. Um, and then. When a script's tone isn't working, when it's tonally all over the place, when they're giving me tonal whiplash, um, 
I will ask, what can you give me two um, to- genre and tonal cousins that you would like this movie to emulate? And usually what happens is somebody gives me like 20. They'll be like, I want it to be this, 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 this. And then those 20 movies are like working against each other tonally. Um, so, t- t- you know, unless so, so you're trying. Like, I want it to be like the Godfather and Space Jam. Yeah. And, you're like, On, what? and, and that's the intent. And, right. and so I would say when you're when you're coming, when you're starting uh, with a script, this tonometer is a great tool and you can kind of say, what are the two genre and tonal cousins that I want my movie to emulate? I mean, relevant to this podcast that Daniel said in the in in the commentary that on every scene when they start a scene, they the first thing they do is write down what scene this is this is an influence by. So they're like, this is our Morpheus meets Neo scene. They literally write that on the page when they're coming up with ideas. Okay, well, what does our movie look like? what does our Morpheus meets Neo scene look like? And then they write that. Like they acknowledge the influences. We're all influenced by stuff. It's better to understand what you're trying to do based on what inspired you than to ignore that and try to like shy away from it. So, but on the, on the topic of tonal whiplash, why do you think these guys work? This, this one works. It's a, I, 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 yeah, it's uh, and th- honestly, this might be the part where to me where I said it gets a little draggy in the middle because sometimes it doesn't totally work for me. <clears throat> but I can tell you why I think this one works. I think this one works because at the heart of it, there's like this independent family drama that is very tonally serious that we keep coming back to, and we're kind of it anchors us in some ways, and then it goes off into these wild places that always are in touch with that um, kind of dramatic side yeah you know they're always in touch with the main character's own story of her regret and her own personal life problems right like yeah Yeah. she's the anchor that keeps us through it i think there's character it's character driven lunacy is kind of what happens so um and so it's organic tonal whiplash is what you're saying to an extent i mean could you say hot dog fingers are really you know I, i you know so there, there's a part of me too that watches this movie and i always say that movies do more than just tell story like yes we could watch a story we could also watch something like a spoof movie and just laugh right and we're and really not being touched emotionally from some spoof movies that could be really really funny and hit some inner truths but they're not touching us in the same way like a different like this movie reminds me and i i i, I don't know what you think about this, Bob? Because you're somebody that likes this too. It it sort of reminds me of sketch in some ways. Like like not that it's all sketch, but there are elements of it that remind me of sketch comedy, where they're just I like, see that. yeah, yeah. We're just gonna go off like it's it's organized with a through line, but then every now and then they go off almost into like the, uh, we want to do this funny sketch. The um, kind of thing. Cooney thing, w- yes, is yes. very sketch like, but also. These guys know cinema. They know setups right. and payoffs, mm-hmm. so they can get away with something that feels so sketch-like to do something where you have the a Pixar right. joke about a guy being controlled by a raccoon, but it's been set up. I think there is like at least three different times it's set up before it actually is revealed yeah. what's happening in that universe. You know what I mean? That sounds so, right. While it's a sketch, it's executed like you would in, as a piece of cinema it's thematically yeah. relevant yeah. It's showing they, her growth they, they, they make they, it they make it do more than one I, thing she she I, helps the guy find yeah. to get the raccoon back which is for yeah. her part of that big third act like mm-hmm. learning session you know what i mean like yeah. They, yeah they make it they use the sketch joke actually part as part of the narrative and it works yes yeah and i th- when i say sketch too it's like key and peel sketch level or yeah, something it's like not, that i don't see that as an insult sketch you know, comedy is yeah. art yeah um, I almost brought to the table the eleven types of jokes and tried to for all, for us to go down the eleven types and show how this movie uses every one because I bet if we did it would. There's so much comedy, so many varieties, right, right, of comedy styles um, in the movie. Yeah, the, but I so so the yeah. as, on the on on my end, I kind of wanted to go back to that um, 
that quote. Uh, I was planning on saying this for later, but I said it too early, which they said, can we use cinematic language? Can we use the tools of the genre to create the emotional and tonal whiplash of what it feels like to live in the world today? And instead of making that experience unpleasant, can we make something meaningful out of that? So I feel like it's just like choosing the multiverse gimmick, choosing the tonal, it's like a tonal gimmick almost, sort of it, this concept demands it like how can you not based on what they're trying to do like it, it would almost feel like they weren't doing their idea justice if this was just ground if this was just all like the family drama and all the different universes were just like that tonally i i feel like the movie wouldn't work based on what they're trying to do so like the movie is about chaos tonal whiplash feels like chaos so it's like it's an extension of the idea itself of why they wanted to make this movie so i i, I kind of wanted to like feel like what's instructive about that you know like if so, it, it, jamie if you had a student who came to you and was like yeah i want to make a movie like everything all at once where every scene is a completely different tone like how, <laughs> what, what kind of proceed with caution would you sit statement would you say to them yeah, Jimmy, I think you're about to get hit with a lot of scripts that use this am, movie as their I am. excuse. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. Um, and and a lot of times it'll be because people don't have the discipline to keep it a singular mm -hmm. tone as opposed to they're trying to do something mm -hmm. new. Um, how many movies like this can we point to that, you know, work? Um, probably very few. Uh, maybe more will come because... I, I think this yeah. is an evolution how, how of can I our modern your time. Question? How yeah. many successful movies can we name? Like well received. Were, yeah, well received. Like yeah. I'm probably a fan of most movies that try to do something like this, but usually those are the movies that you have to like put on your guilty pleasure list or something because people <laughs> usually hate them. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> they're I, I, I was I was trying to kind of find a lineage to what this was. Like and to me I went back to like when I was when I was a kid, I was a big Terry Gilliam fan. Mm -hmm. And I think and Terry Gilliam, you know, to compare this to that isn't quite right. But Terry Gilliam was was trying to do these huge fantasy comedies that had deep heart and meaning. And, you know, and it mm -hmm. it's it reminded me sort of of what he was aiming for. But mm -hmm. all of his movies were kind of failures in some ways. You know, they all were kind of box office busts. And not not failures from my perspective. I love that. Sure. Yeah. But, um. I'm just talking money wise and stuff. And they were like, can we keep giving this guy money? Um, you know, it's, it's not really working, but similarly superhero movies tended to be bust back when I was a kid too. So, and eventually they, they figured that out, you know, so this, is this the start of the evolution that we've landed here? Cause I see a lot of people like this reminded me at times of community, you know, I saw the Russo brothers, um, uh, you know, were producers. And I thought back to some of their comedy, what they added to something like community or something like that. And again, Key and Peel, and there's some other, is, will we start seeing more things like this? Or is this just the weird anomaly? And I'm not really sure. I, I would not... put, if I had to put money on it, I'd say anomaly. Okay. Like, I, I mean, I think people are going to try. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Jim, Jimmy's going to get a bunch of My I'm inbox not, is going to be filled with all that. PDFs, PDFs that I open but, and look just like this. And I that's okay. Here's the thing is, I don't see a lot of people. A lot of people aren't going to. They're not the Daniels. Yeah. They're, uh, not, but, they're just not. It's they're not, the age old thing. Like, it, you know, like people always point to like when you say like it's hard to pull this off and people then point to a masterpiece and they go, well, they I, did it. And it's like, yeah, you're not well, Quentin fucking, Tarantino. They're geniuses. Yeah. They're geniuses. I, yeah. I, but I no see offense, things, listener. I, <laughs> yeah, right. I, I see things that are very popular. Like, uh, Sorry to bother you had a weird vibe to it. You yeah, know, yeah, that, yeah. that was a movie. Love it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, there's, there's a part of me and, and then even like seeping into our superhero movies, like um, into the spider verse was a little like this in some ways mm -hmm. yeah, it was yeah. kind of wacky and and all out there um so i don't know I, I there is a part of me that thinks it might be a tiny sea change like but but again it it requires a certain level of uh movies of like you say brilliance or something so yeah i, yeah. I, I think it's craft i think we're talking about the it's same craft. Thing. i'm not yeah. saying that there's not going to be movies that aim for it definitely yeah. i was just saying the movies that are successfully pulling it off mm -hmm. you know yeah, they actually it's... connect with this connected with people yeah. in a big way. 
I think some movies are going to try stuff like this and they won't, they'll just hit like a wall. It just I, won't work because everything wants to compete with culture. And as these guys have already said, the Jamie said is that our culture is white noise on top of white noise. Like we, we you know, we often talk on this show about how we're almost talking about a dying art form at dying, times. Right. Cause, no, Cause kids don't watch these damn movies. They're, they're more concerned with, you know, it's got we sound. Yeah. Old. But you know what I mean? It's like, true. it's true. But like, this is a movie that successfully, uh, it, it successfully feeds us people like us, and it could feed a kid that is. Only it watching spoke TikTok. to a younger generation right. too. Yep. Yeah, it can, and it's meeting culture where it like it's change or die, right? Like, I, I guess mm-hmm. that's what you're kind of saying, Jamie. Like, will movies mm-hmm. try to 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 keep up with the internet <laughs> and do right. it while still having some semblance of brilliance and craft? Yeah, yeah, and it. I'm just saying, will these filmmakers start to be the ones that that take control a little bit more? Um, I, I think you could argue also like Edgar Wright was a little bit at the start of I, that too. I, I agree. Yes, um, Edgar like Wright that. was another one playing with a lot of tone. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 There's, so there's, maybe you know we'll see, but uh, it takes Edgar Wright and the, and Daniels are like. <laughs> It's not just anybody. <laughs> That's right. very true. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But true, true of most most filmmakers. You true, know, even the right. ones we talk about in this podcast to get where they got usually means there's a huge level of talent. Even if you hate their movies, uh, even if mm-hmm. they're somebody you despise, there's something really going on that they stood out and were able to do these things. Yep. Um, one more thing though, to this point, I do occasionally see on the blacklist spec scripts that are kind of like this in fact i would say and i jimmy i really don't want to give you more work reviewing these kind of scripts <laughs> but i would say bring it least, on good problems at, at least a couple times a year you'll see a script I'll, i'm putting it in quotes like this which is just kind of absurd it kind mm-hmm. of it has heart and mixes tone it just goes for it um, there's a term that people were calling this year. They said, write your fuck, your fuck it script, right? Yeah. Right. Just, just write the one that you're like, fuck it. I'm going to write it. I don't care about the rules anymore. I'm just going to go write this thing. That's usually yeah. my and, favorite stuff. Yeah. And yeah. and there was a, there's a big, like, I, I know Twitter, a lot of people were saying, that's the script you should be writing. You should be writing that one. And this feels like that kind of script, like, you know what? Everybody keeps putting this noise in my ear. I'm just going to go write this thing. I, you know, I'm just going to kind of do trust my every horrible instinct and go write a script. There, there are like every now and then you'll see this, these kind of scripts on the blacklist. So it is a strategy <laughs> in a weird sort of way. Um, that that could that work. That could work. Um, usually those scripts like this movie have great craft to them they're not Mm -hmm. just a bunch of nonsense on the page they do have an emotional story they do use all the craft tricks that we talk about on this show as this one does as well um so you know i don't think it's totally you know out of the realm to think somebody shouldn't write a script like this yeah um just like you said jimmy proceed with great deals of caution Great deals of discipline. I know it sounds strange to say write this kind of script with discipline, but just know exactly what your intention is. Yeah, the organicness. And yeah. The organicness. Don't do it because you haven't figured out that there's not a difference between, you know, two different movies, you know, what whatever they are, you know, two two tonally. Like if you don't know the difference between Lego Batman and Christopher Nolan Batman, somehow in your head they're the same thing. That could be a problem. Um, (laughs) But if you realize you're going to take this movie and do this sudden left turn and you're doing it with intention. All of a sudden, everybody's in Legos. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Then then it might make sense. So that's that's my spiel on. on, uh, Okay. yeah, that's I kind I wanted to get your take on it. So, yeah. Also, don't do it just because you think that's what's popular. That's definitely the worst. That's the worst. Definitely not. Yeah, because then it's not informed by the concept. I like like the one thing you can say about Daniels is like they do they're not doing this because everything's intentional. Everything's intentional, but I was gonna say like it's not just them going like what would the what would the internet generation love? Like these guys <laughs> love a, they want a movie like this. They would be happy to watch a movie like this that they didn't mm-hmm. make. Like I have a feeling I, like you know what I mean. Like they yeah. like that they're making what they love too. I think I think speaking of comedy writing and as a as a person that takes comedy writing very seriously, mm-hmm. there is a fear 
that's sometimes absurd is um, funny when it's not. So sometimes absurd can fall really flat because people just think non sequitur for no reason or no thought can be funny. And sometimes it can, but honestly, more often than not, it's not funny. Like it just, just simply being absurd isn't always for the like sake the of absurdity. Yeah. Sake, yeah. Yeah. And that, that would be the wrong lesson I would learn from this. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, well now a guy's jumping on things to get up his butt to do a thing, you know, <laughs> you know, that whether you like that joke or not, there's, there's some kind of, I get why that's funny, but sometimes it's not funny <laughs> or sometimes but it also, doesn't fit. It's, it's also, it's the, in the, in this case, it's given a reason too. Mm-hmm. It's given a it's reason. not just yep. the randomness of putting up somebody's butt. The and that reason is also thematic, which we'll get into later. Right. That's about the chaos. It, like um, it, to me, that's not random. It's, it's not that that's yeah. exactly my point. Like, yeah. It's, all, none of that's Yep. That's, it's it's well thought out, but you could see something where just you could see the bad version of that, where people are just saying, "What's our can, butt plug?" Yeah, I can do What's anything. What's our butt that. plug? Yeah, all <laughs> all of a sudden a dragon's going to attack just because it's absurd, you know? And it's like, no, that's not. There, you know, you got to set up the world. I feel like I feel like uh the the kind of hack take on the movie is it's a bunch of non sequitur sequiturs and it's not right funny. they're not I, no, 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 no. I don't the see that through line not uh, at all I don't see that when I watch I, the movie. No, not at all I, I I'm more viewing the bad version Jimmy's gonna get yeah I'm trying to because yeah, you oh, yeah, could Jimmy's learn bad lessons yeah, from yeah. the movie you so could I learn bad to lessons talk about it there's a lot of people who don't understand the craft behind the ideas the intent behind the ideas could take bad less bad lessons from this so yeah thanks for like given us your take jamie because i wanted to hear it so um well with that let's also let's talk about tension yes this is yeah there's, this movie does a lot of different types of tension <laughs> jamie i felt like this was a good episode to revisit your tension types yeah yeah so um i talk a lot about tension when i do seminars and and helping people write because at some point in my career i really realized that when you talk about conflict and you talk about uh, situations, uh, really what you're talking about is is tension. They're they're tension engines. They're and I think tension is the thing that gets us to flip the page. And it really mm-hmm. what I bo- what I boil down tension to is putting some kind of question in the viewer or the audience's mind that they really either fear being answered or they absolutely need to be answered or a little bit of both sometimes. Um, but there's something, there's something in them. There's some itch that needs to be scratched, I always say, or something. Um, and sometimes that tension is, is, uh, curiosity. Um, sometimes it could be fear and suspense. Sometimes it's a mystery. Sometimes it's almost like a poetic or surreal kind of curiosity, which that's one of the harder ones to define. Mm -hmm. So, uh, cinematic, sometimes it's just in the way it's shot, which certainly this movie has all over the place. Um, and then, and then there's the classic romantic relationship tension. Uh, will they, will they get together? Will they be in love? Will they break up? Will they, you know, make up, you know, all that kind of stuff. So these are just some types of tension in movies. The, the biggest driver of tension in a movie is usually it's really comes from the log line. It's a hero has a goal and there's obstacles and stakes. Like that's the primary driver of tension, but then within scenes or before you set that up, or even after you complete that, there's usually other forms of tension that drive the story. And the tension is the thing that makes the story not boring. Like as soon as you lose tension, as soon as you're like, I don't care. Um, that, <laughs> that's when things get a little boring. So, yeah. And I wanted to show how, um, cause, cause a lot of times when you throw out a tool to someone and you teach them, um, there's this, uh, tendency to just use it once and not to stack it, you know, like you can have, you know, this is not, this is not the same technique, but you can have five, six, different types of stakes happening all at once. You can have 
five, six different ticking clocks happening all at once. Like that Mission Impossible is the story engine for that. Is always, there's more than one clock happening all at once. And in the same way, these tensions that Jamie just mentioned, you can stack them within a, within a scene. You can have all of these happening back to back to back in different little ways to keep the audience engaged and really um, deepen the characters, right? So I kind of wanted to, uh, so I broke down the opening three minute scene, which is basically just um, Wayman and Evelyn talking. Um, and then I figured we could just extend that into just talking about the opening sequence in general. Sure. Um, so I, I broke down the opening scene and Sorry if I mislabel the tensions, but I did my best. Uh, so if you think it's different, just just let me know. So, yeah, that, I mean, there's many more than the list I just right. listed. <clears throat> so, but those know, core ones are really really helpful. And mm -hmm. and and just if you go through a scene and it's not, it doesn't have any of these things, it's really easy to be like, well, how can I add some curiosity or some fear? You know, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, so Evelyn's first line, she says, "They have to hurry." So you're right, right away. First line of the script, there's curiosity. Why do they have to hurry? You know, I just, like you said, a question is planted. Why do they have to hurry? Um, Waymond is holding a paper in his hands and he says, is now a good time to talk about something? So there's a mystery. There's why, why, what does he want to talk about? What is in his hand? You know, um, Evelyn says, no, she has to finish what she's doing before her father wakes up. So that's relationship tension. Bam, we have three different types of tension within the first 30 seconds. Evelyn asks Wayman to steam the tablecloths for tonight. Curiosity, why what's does he have to steam? Tonight, what's right. going on tonight? What's yeah. happening? Um, Wayman says he has a fun surprise for her dad. Mystery, what's the surprise? I wanna know more about this. Um, is, does it have something to do with what's in his hand? Uh, Wayman asks again, can they talk later? Again, he's, way, he's got this, hand, this paper in his hand and we see it. And we want to know, mystery, what the hell's in his hand? Um, Evelyn, Evelyn interrupts him to make sure that Wayman checks the noodles in five minutes because her father hates overcooked noodles. Once again, relationship tension. Uh, Wayman tries to reassure her that the party for her father will go well and, and her father will be proud of her. Evelyn worries her dad won't see it that way. Again, relationship, another relationship tension on top of the one before. Wayman says it doesn't matter what her father sees, it's what he it's what Evelyn sees about herself, right? And Evelyn looks around at the mess and stress around her, silent. So that's like a nice cinematic tension, Jamie, that you mentioned. The the camera pulls back and we just see a wide shot of the mess and we feel her tension and her stress. So that's your cinematic tension. Um, Evelyn's dad wakes up in the other room and yells off screen. Evelyn is stressed that he's up already and she leaves to see him. Relationship tension. Bam, another one. As she leaves, Wayman asks again with the paper in his hand, can they talk later? She ignores him. This, and then we see the paper, he wants a divorce. So we have romantic tension. Right. So that's all that happens within three minutes and, and you feel that tension, right? That's why that scene feels so stressful because they're just stacking one different type of tension that Jamie mentioned on top of another. And I think this is a great example of to probably if you, if you track the scene after that and the scene after that, you'll find those types of tension again because they wanted to pile on everything everywhere all at once. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's yeah. Really yeah, and the the one thing about that opening too, <clears throat> and this is kind of going into the opening sequence in yeah. general. Yeah, that it it moves so fast, like it it really throws you into this world, and um, and it does a thing that I am a heavy preacher on. Like I'm a big time, don't start with the breakfast scene, don't start with people, <laughs> you know, not the in motion. Clock, the alarm clock. Y yeah, get things in motion. Have. 50 things going on at once and have people dealing with the most stressful day of their life. And one thing I'd say with, that this movie does is it's a thing we talked about. And I always bring up Mitchell's versus the machines for this. This movie reminds me of that in the way that um, you could almost see what this movie would be like without the genre stuff in it. You could almost mm -hmm. feel this movie. You could take all the genre stuff out 
and make some kind of independent film with these same great actors and great performances. And you probably could construct some different movie that's a relationship movie. And this movie already feels like it's got that story is going, you know, there's there's the IRS closing them down. There's relationship issues. There's mother daughter issues. There's about to get a divorce. There's the dad who there's kind who, of a, uh, a normal A twenty four movie happening without it's, some yeah stuff yeah <laughs> pretty it's much normal, yeah, it's yeah. a normal A twenty four movie and then the genre stuff interrupts and it it allows us to work through the same A twenty four movie stuff we normally work through yeah um but it. It, then then it also adds this other you know fun layer to it as well right. so the constructive thing there is the story before the story um when you write your story when you're envisioning it i know it's fun to come up with the catalyst to come up with the break into two these save the cat terms the regular plot stuff but how can, can you start your story with your characters already in motion something already going on can we join the middle of some other story that has a lot of tension that we just talked about that's filled with tension and it's filled with then conflict scenes and fun interchanges. So we learn about people's relationship without just people saying, I'm sad. My daughter never talks to me over the <laughs> breakfast table. We actually see the daughter and her um, having their issue right in front of us in a dramatic scene mm -hmm. that can be acted out. So yeah, that I, makes I life, this. right? we learn who we yeah. are in the chaos Yep. You know, yeah, with your characters, like we're we like in this sequence, we're we're visiting a normal chaotic day of her life. Right, it's always us. like everything this. we need to know about Evelyn is in this scene. Why but, she yeah. regrets her life, why her life is a mess, why it's a stress, why it's stressful, <laughs> and why her husband probably wants to get out of this because he's not getting much from it. Yeah, yeah I definitely, I, I didn't break down the things that need fixing, but it does a great job, and it kind of it kind of made me think that those things that they you can. I bet you can kind of use the t those types of tension and the yes, things in, yes. in, that need fixing sort of partner them up together. Right, right, you know? yeah. yeah. Right. It, no, as you were saying them, I was like, wow, they're all the things that need fixing at the same time, uh, yes. the ones you were saying. But, you know, it, things that need fixing is a save the cat term, but it's it's just a term from them. But every you see it everywhere. And it's basically setting up why – why the hero's life needs to change. Like why, why is the hero's life just a complete mess? And, and the big thing to take away from it is things. It's always plural. Cause I think mm -hmm. when I was a beginning writer, I mm -hmm. thought maybe I'll have the thing that needed fixing. Mm -hmm. Like you, it'd be the IRS thing. Right. And that would be need it. Money, and I'd be need done. Money yeah. I need money. Forgive you. Right. But look at all the things that they're stacking in this first scene. Yep. You no, know, the grandfather, the daughter relationship, the fact that the daughter generational trauma really the generational, generational trauma, trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. the um the divorce the the laundromat the irs mm -hmm. problems the the bad air conditioner whatever i mean it's all these things and they all inform the existential crisis you, right <laughs> they all inform it and and they Even just home, the homophobia them. of the family right and, yeah yeah, right, I, yeah. I, I yeah and i'm going to speak to that later they actually yeah. talked about that yeah. um and, and, and but that's the thing I I think this is really um, this really illustrates is make sure you have those things that need fixing. This when I do story consulting, I am constantly seeing scripts that don't have things that need fixing mm -hmm. constantly, and it drives or like it, you said one, yeah, or just one. has one. They and that out can't the sustain one. ninety pages. No, um, no, and 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 when you're asking yourself what how do I derive these things like how do I get those usually the the best way to do it usually is you construct the person's flaw and then you say how does that flaw mess up every relationship in their life their home their work and their play like everything like how can this flaw kind of mess everything up and then you can also do it from other directions like different characters flaws to back to the character right. just write them down come up with them put do them a whiteboard in, just of that whiteboard do a whiteboard. And if you come in, if you make a little story before the story that concerns those things that need All fixing, those. they'll organically roll out in your setup. And you can see how when you stack them on top of each other, like so fast, it can work. It works in this story. You know, we're getting so many of those right away on it's top making, of each other, seconds apart. It's giving the story energy in a weird yeah, sort of way. It, it, it actually is yeah, what yeah, gives totally. the story energy. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up a couple quotes to to all of these points, sort of fr- from Daniels about these these strategies. So they said. We knew we wanted to make Evelyn's life everything, everywhere, all at once and overwhelming. And we knew from there we could build the whole story around that. So they said, we wanted it to feel chaotic without using any sci-fi. We wanted to make everyone talking past each other to show that even without the sci-fi, everyone is already living in a multiverse. Everyone's in their own universe, even though they technically are living in the same plane of existence. The grandfather speaks Cantonese, Wayman speaks Mandarin, and Joy can barely speak either language. We wanted to show the audience that we already exist in the multiverse before the sci-fi comes into play. The opening scene sets up the core problem for Evelyn, which is... In a chaotic world that's constantly pulling your attention toward other things, it becomes impossible to look at the people and see eye to eye with them, even the ones you love. And that accidentally hurts everyone. So, I mean, that's the whole movie right there (laughs) in two quotes. Right. And they all see, and they all kind of see the world. It's not just that. It's not just the language barrier, and not just what you perspectives. Said. Their perspectives are insanely different. Like Wayman, oh, man. obviously, Wayman's kind of the one that already kind of has the answer to life, but he's <laughs> surrounded by people that don't. He's right? the major agent of change, which yeah. is not on our list. Wayman, Wayman is the agent of change for everyone, right? Um, but and to your point, Bob, and this is also you know more craft that's not on the list. They do this great technique over and over they play with it in so many ways which is a scene dip deepening technique you can use we've talked about a lot about shifting changing perspectives and how that can create tension and drama but what can also create great tension is when one scene is happening and multiple characters have completely different perspectives about what the fuck is going on right and this 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 movie is one scene after another where Everyone in the scene has completely different understandings of what's happening. They talked about it a lot in the commentary that Wayman thinks he's in a family divorce drama like the whole time. Right. (laughs) And Evelyn is like, oh, shit, I'm in a sci fi action movie where I'm the hero, but I'm not capable of being the hero. And then, you know, um, Joy is in her own existential nihilistic um, David Lynchian anti plot story. So. You know, and the grandfather, he's just frustrated at everybody because he can't understand the language. (laughs) Um, So this movie is a great example of stacking those perspectives on top of each other where you have one scene and every character has a completely different understanding of what's happening and the drama and dynamic that that creates. And and the reason it works is because where the where they keep the audience. Right. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, we're we're kind of we're ahead we're ahead of everybody we're to some degree. Just a little bit. A little a little bit ahead of Evelyn by like an inch. Just, just like, a step. Just a yeah. step ahead of Evelyn. Barely. But, but it's enough to keep our to keep our hands firmly on It, on it the creates edge. this yeah. rooting interest in her getting on board and right. figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, it works. It's it, like it, and you're like, how is she gonna navigate this situation when Wayman thinks he's in a family divorce drama? <laughs> <laughs> not to mention even like to go on top of what you said like you don't you even have different waymans mm-hmm. that understand what's happening differently <laughs> like there is a wayman that knows he is part of a sci-fi drama yeah. with evelyn but there's also the one that is getting a divorce and <laughs> yeah and that instantly makes that scene more interesting right right, right. so yeah. yeah all right let's talk about fight scenes yeah this this uh movie has It does something very on the nose that gets talked about a lot in creating good fight scenes. And uh, so they say, and I always have a hard time with this in some ways, because they say, like, here's the thing that you always hear, the information. Fight scenes should always advance the plot or develop character or both. Like, and, And a lot of times you'll hear fight scenes should always be about character in some ways and i look at like a john wick movie and there's like six stacked fight scenes i'm like yeah they're kind of about character but yeah more about plot yeah they're more about plot so yeah, i yeah, i get yeah. the plot part the plot part totally makes sense sometimes the character part is a little harder like how do you how do you develop a character in a wild fight scene you know what what's the way to do it this movie does it with all their fight scenes because i think it melds i i 
I, you know, I really viewed this movie as like this independent drama that then has like, where's the close of a genre movie? Like I, as opposed to like, like I'm more concerned with the family in this movie than I am about whether the universe will be saved. It, like John, John Wick is actually about the stylistic fight scenes themselves. It's right. directed by a stunt man. That's it's the a point. genre expectations. Right, yeah. right. Like it's different it, than what we're talking about here. It's just it's yeah. it's a it's a reel almost. It's a it's a yeah. you know it's mm -hmm. a it's a stunt reel. But but here's which the is thing. okay, which is okay. But but that's what I'm saying is people say uh, and when I say people and I'm not and this is something. I don't necessarily always see myself. So when I saw this, I was like, well, this does a really good job of it. Um, but you will get the advice that fight scenes need to develop character, or change character, or, or be about character. And um, a lot of times I have a hard time seeing that in the action movies. Uh, in this movie, it was very you know, easy to figure out like most of the action scenes were kind of learning experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but one one of the things like I was kind of charting like the first action scene to me is is in some ways my favorite, which is the the uh, fanny pack scene, right? Sure, yeah. Um, and in that scene, even in a small way, how does it develop character? In some ways, that that scene's part of. I, I don't know that I chart it this way, but it's part of the debate. Um, mm -hmm. She starts out feeling one way, and she ends up feeling a different way, and I think to me that's the important thing that when you're writing a fight scene and, and this is a very save the cat kind of card kind of thing is that in save the cat there's a thing called emotional change mm -hmm. and if you can if you can change your character if you can write down how your character starts a scene and and they actually end the scene slightly differently or in some ways differently then your scene matters and it matters to advancing plot. It matters to advancing character development. Yeah, it's consequential. Um, it's consequential. Um, yeah, yeah, and this I does, think this does it all right. This this it, every it every one the of those concept scenes. of doing something random. It introduces us to pretty much like the abilities of Alpha vs. Wayman, and it shows and uh, it shows and, us and, what she could be like. What she could be like, and I feel like also it's Evelyn seeing her husband in a new way. For the first time, I mean, sure, she meets him in the closet and everything, but this is when she kind of like sees her husband do something that she didn't know was, uh, you know, capable. She's placed just as much limitation on who on women him. can be as she does right. on herself, exactly, and her daughter. Yep. And yep. Yeah. And and just from a plot perspective, well said, I, Bob. Thanks. I I think this transforms her from somebody that's like, <clears throat> this is all insane. I need to just go home kind of situation to I'm stuck in this mess by the end of that scene. Um, and I think there's, there's, this isn't you know, going away. Yeah, she's this in the sci-fi movie yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. She, this yeah. Is... This, this isn't a misunderstanding. This right. is real by the end of it. And I, I think if you can, in your fight scenes, just make sure that there's that kind of advancement, whether it's character or plot, then usually your fight scenes will, won't just be gratuitous. It won't just be like, oh, I need to spice this up with a little karate scene, you know, or whatever. Also, whatever people do. Can, can <laughs> I also right insert add, fight scene? All, yeah. On top of this sauce that Jamie's talking about, it's also funny. He's fighting with a fanny pack. They're jokes. Yep. There's like visible uh, humor in it throughout. Throughout that also yeah. makes the fight scene feel more substantial. The the, the um the fight scenes is this. We're not talking about this, but we talk about a thing called premise paint, and this yeah. scene. Def this this movie every scene has fight scenes really the the idea of premise pain is how is your you know it's a karate scene we've seen a million of them right how is the karate scene it in this movie how is it the only karate uh, the only the only movie that could have this karate scene yep you, you know? a scene you could only see in this movie yeah. that's that's what i was trying to say yeah. <laughs> but yeah but exactly and this movie a does that every fight single time. can only happen here right yeah, yeah. I, I think I honestly, I honestly think that's that's probably Daniel's superpower is they're really, really good at that. They like really work through the through the whiteboard of this. Yes. Yeah. This is another example of, uh, you know, I read a lot of scripts where people don't do this. We're not seeing scenes or characters 
situations, or in this case, tactics that are so unique to this concept that we could only experience them while watching this movie in this story world. And that's what brings people back. That's what creates the rewatch value. The reason that people want to keep revisiting your world is because you're giving them an experience we can't get in any other movie. So they want to come back. It's not, it, you, they can't get it in their own world and they can't get it in any other story. They can only get it in this story world. And so this is, this movie is a great example of those, of those weird multiverse concept specific tactics where it's a movie about how you can connect with your other selves and learn from them. And like in order to connect with them, the verse jumping thing, you have to make random, random spontaneous choices. So that in itself is a whiteboard, right? I mean, how many, they probably had a hundred different things that they were like, okay, they probably did that hundred idea theory. Like what are the weirdest things we can that have people could do, do? Right. <laughs> right? Like putting shoes on the wrong feet, eating chapstick, the paper cuts. Oh my gosh. That's one of my favorite scenes I've seen in a movie in forever. Paper, um, taking a nap, taking a nap, <laughs> telling Deirdre, Deirdre as she's attacking her, that she loves her tickling her nose with a sex toy, chugging a two liter of orange soda spontaneously, peeing your pants and then of course the Chekhov's butt plug they they said their friends coined that term <laughs> of the trophies and yeah. yeah Chekhov's butt plug yeah so it's a great example this movie like it's a movie about chaos and how nothing matters and what better way to express that than by random spontaneous actions being how you survive and how you succeed <laughs> like it's so cool and then, like like you said, Jamie, like the using Evelyns to fight, using other Evelyns to fight, that expresses the movie. It, that Like, you can't see that in any other movie. It's not like The Matrix where you download skills, like, from a computer. You download it from yourself. Um, it's so cool and so specific to this movie. And then, then it, they continue to evolve that with the empathy fighting, right? Ultimately, the theme is that the not so secret weapon of this movie is empathy and human connection. So they, they play with that, like that empathy fighting. We've never seen anything like that. So I think this is, this movie is another instructive example of how you can, it's completely unconventional in the tactics that you're taking and you're getting that premise paint that Jamie just talked about over and over. And they really did those whiteboards. Like you said, they, Bob, they wrote it for six years. I mean, right. think of all right. the ideas they went through before they got to these. Yeah. No, that, no, it's, it, the, <laughs> This is the this is like the movie of the decade of you can only see it here, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's and that's you can only see a conversation between two rocks in this movie, you know, like <laughs> yeah, and it works. Yeah, and it yeah. works. Yeah, it like, works it, so well. Yeah, um, old way, new way. Okay, explain so this. I, I kind of want to breeze yeah. this through. So so this is this is the meaningful choices um, conversation, but I didn't track her choices. Um, uh, about dilemmas and meaningful choices and how uh, your character becomes engaging through the, the dilemmas that the movie faces them with and the choices they make uh, are, are how we as an audience watch them grow and change. Um, and this movie is filled with dilemmas and filled with meaningful choices, but that's not what this exercise is about. Um, recently, I've codified for, codified for clients sort of to help teach this. Uh, building off of Jamie's idea of the before and after snapshot, um, if you if if you uh, are concerned about like proving whether your character has changed, has arced, uh, you can kind of look and see their before snapshot and then compare it to their after snapshot. And if there's growing pains in between that earn that, then you really know that you've done a good job of of uh, you know making their arc measurable. Yeah. And you know if the before snapshot is exactly like the after snapshot, then they haven't changed at all. Or if they that after snapshot happens way too soon, you know, um, then they haven't changed at all. So, but taking that idea and that approach to another level. Uh, a really good way to do this is at the beginning of the movie to present your character with the choice. And then 
at the in the third act after we've seen their growing pains to present them with the exact same choice and show how they make a different choice now that they've grown and changed and learned quote unquote learn the lesson so it's so crazy because in spider-man new way home no way home um Peter only does has one moment like this where he makes t- t- has the same choice and makes the right choice the second time and it feels like a deep growth right, right. Evelyn I I found seven different old way new way so this is kind of speaks to why it feels like such a profound um it, you know eventful story for her character just all the different ways they show you how she's changed so um and if you guys think of any more that I missed, um, let me I know. I mean, I probably had, would have this. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. like, like. So, so the idea is the old way is the before snapshot. In in a traditional drama, if you're if it's a tragedy, they don't learn, or they start the right way, and then their new way is the wrong way, you know. But in this case, and we'll get on the nihilism in a minute, which kind of usually would contradict this. But anyway, the old way is the wrong way. The new way is the right way. So, uh, old way Evelyn refuses to let Joy come to the IRS meeting. New way Evelyn brings Joy to the IRS meeting to help her translate. Old way Evelyn, Becky says hi to her, and Evelyn completely ignores her, talks past her to Joy, doesn't even acknowledge her existence. New way Evelyn, they're dropping them off at the IRS thing. Becky's even driving, so she let her drive them. And Becky says goodbye to Evelyn, and Evan, Evelyn lovingly criticizes her haircut, which we've learned is, is her in, a term of endearment. Um, old way Evelyn lies and introduces Becky to her father as Joy's good friend. Right. New way Evelyn introduces Becky to Gong as Joy's girlfriend. Right. So here we're seeing the, these choices, the exact same choice. Um, old way Evelyn stops Joy from leaving the laundromat but she can't muster the emotional availability to tell her daughter how she feels. And instead she just Comments scorns and insults her. Yeah. New way Evelyn. And this is the biggest one. Of course, this is the big moment in the movie. New way Evelyn stops joy from leaving lovingly insults her, pours her heart out to her, tells her how much it hurts joy, her that joy doesn't want to connect with her. Make sure Joy knows how much she loves her and then embraces her and tells her that she's going to cherish every speck of time with her. Um, you could even just say she hugs her. Just, she hugs just, her. Yeah, just hugging her yeah. daughter is like, yeah, that's what she didn't also. She, she also didn't get from her father. She but learned like, that. Right. Right. At the old way of that scenario and co- in contrast to the so new what way happens, yeah. shows you so much how but, much growth and change turned into a hug. Yep. And that's the whole yeah. movie, right? That's like the whole movie, right? Mm-hmm. The whole movie. Um, old way, as they're getting on the IRS elevator, Wayman is desperate to connect. He sees an old couple kissing. Um, and he asks Evelyn if they can t- take a trip together. She literally says, "I if I have to think of one more thing today, my head will explode. <laughs> uh, new way, Evelyn, before getting on the IRS a- elevator, Evelyn spontaneously grabs Wayman and kisses him. And in the script, which is an old draft of this scene where it was Jackie Chan, it says maybe for the first time in years. <laughs> so, well, yeah, and it, you if, get the sense it, that it, it, happened. it yeah. feels like that. Um, and then th- this is the last one. Um, this is just a bigger general one. It's not really a specific, it, it's an old tactic, new tactic kind of thing. Um, uh, Evelyn uses verse jumping to gain skills to fight and kill others or just fight others. Uh, New way, Evelyn, uh, what are you doing? I'm learning to fight like you. She verse jumps to gain knowledge of other people's pain and right. helps them heal. So that that's seven major examples of this old way, new way strategy. Mm-hmm. Outside so I think of, it's, yeah. Outside of the romance, uh, old way, new way with Wayman, you could also say in the beginning, she doesn't listen to Wayman at all. Mm-hmm. But in yeah. the end... I mean, the crux of the entire end is her actually listening. Oh, yeah. I skipped. I read past that, which is the uh, overwhelmed by the IRS office chaos surrounding her. Deirdre asked Evelyn if she was paying attention. Evelyn lies and says she's paying attention. And the new way she's enamored by the chaos surrounding her. 
that's the distraction is how much she's enamored by it. Right. right. Um, and Deirdre asks Evelyn if she was paying attention and Evelyn says, no, can you repeat what you said? So, to your point, Bob, she's paying attention. Yeah. I meant more specifically to Wayman, but yes, overall in general. Overall, she yeah, not yeah. Be, she's focused versus unfocused. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, in the end. Right, totally. yeah. yeah. So it, it's just, this is a, if you're trying to kind of put your fingers on the pulse of what this old way, new way technique is, this is a great movie to learn from. It does it at least seven times in really clear examples to learn from. Almost like we say, look, almost Disney level, despite it being such an indie out there, uh, unconventional story, right? Yeah. In, in our culture, A24 is like the opposite of Disney, right? Yeah, but but those are very Disney-like moments. Moments, um, right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think this is a is one of these cases, and I think this is the way to go. Like if you're writing something that is absurd and wacky and out there and anything that can happen, sometimes the underlying structure and the underlying checkboxes need to be about as vanilla or classic or to mm-hmm. the form as possible. Cause you don't want to get creative in those if you're getting so in, wacky and wild in the other <laughs> things. You know? So and that's a, yeah. no, and that that's a good that honestly does bring us to theme, right? Because yeah, because uh, what you're talking about is what is what's the lesson moment of the whole movie, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, J- J- Jimmy, I'm gonna push back on you, but like you said, yeah. you think first. No, I, I, it's just, uh, and I've got some great quotes with their their take on the theme and why yeah, they yeah. chose the theme, but uh, and I'll I'll interject while you're talking where it's where it's relevant, but uh, for me, um. I'm just a really spiritual guy, man. And I, I, uh, you know, like there's a lot of things that led to us having this podcast. I'm a person who believes that everything matters. The butterfly effect, um, the, the idea that nihilism is a positive thing. Uh, I, and, and it, it led me to like do some research and learn that there's like several different types of nihilism. Yeah, and yeah. I had just been putting nihilism in a really small box it's and not so that's just the my, bad that's, guys from Big Lebowski. No, and, <laughs> <laughs> nothing matters. Uh, yeah, right, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, no, uh, so I, that's my naivete. That's my ignorance. Mm-hmm. Putting my programming, putting nihilism in a very small box. So, so I feel what this movie wants me to feel. I just don't be- like. I feel like the message is a fantasy. And yeah. maybe maybe they think it's a fantasy. I don't know, but to me, it's a fantasy. Like nihilism is a great a, thing. It's coming from a perspective. I'll give you that. Absolutely. I yeah. don't think the Daniels are spiritual. Hmm. Yeah, they talk I, a lot about science in there. I, I in do their, not think they're spiritual uh, commentary at all. Right, but I don't. I also don't think they're uh, malicious in their thoughts about those who are. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make you, sense? Yeah. Usually, it's like it's like when I. I used to have a friend that was an anarchist and that sounds like somebody that blows up buildings or <laughs> right, something. That sets fires and shit. But really it came from a place of like, I don't know what's good. Your idea might be good. My idea might be good. Their idea might be good. I don't know. That was kind of, <laughs> that was, that was kind of his approach. So it's, he always took a positive anarchy approach. Interesting. Thing. So that's it's, kind of it, like this. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing. So it's like, I think, I think the person who was nihilistic, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking for them. I have no idea. But there might be a thing where they're like, your approach might work too, you know, whatever. I don't know. No, but, but the reason I brought this up yeah. is not because of that, Bob. I didn't yeah. want to say I don't no, believe I'm waiting movie. for you to give me more so I can talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yep. Jamie, we've, in the, in the Mist episode, and I believe in the Parasite episode, um, we talked about how, storytelling with nihilistic endings like what is how, what is the the engine and 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 it's like about whether the audience learns the lesson whether the character learns the lesson so i i, I thought you could recap that and we could talk yeah. about how this movie subverts that intentionally like it is intentionally yeah, sure. a subversion yeah, yeah. of this and yeah and i yeah and I, it's uh so so and, and a lot of this comes from the moral premise has a that it's big on on nihilism and stuff like that uh you mean the but book genera- right the book the book the moral, is the, yeah, yeah. um it's it's big on being it it doesn't you know it says it's it's not a good idea um if you have a negative message or a message a message that says there's two real bad things you can do either a theme like 
like a negative message, like um, murder is great, you know, or something like that. <laughs> it's usually not a good message for, if you want your movie to be successful. I mean, you could do it. And there probably are some horror movies that do it and they just leave you feeling miserable. And that's kind of their purpose. But um, but anyway, it's not a good idea. But the other thing is, which is less um, in your face, is kind of like, hey, uh, it's kind of something as a teenager, I probably would have written a lot. And I see a lot of teenagers or young people maybe write, this is the way the world works. The world sucks. Then you die. That's the message. Yeah. Like and parasite. Yeah. yeah. That's realism. That's realistic. You can't get out. You can't it escape it no matter what you do. Right. And the idea is that when you're making film, you want to you want a message of the world the way you wish it was or could be or the positive side of it, as opposed to just saying the thing that we're probably all deep down worried about, which is, oh, no, the world just sucks and then we die. And it's movies bad. Are, movies or stories are an escape to where we wish the world was, but you know, which life yeah. was. I think yeah. the three examples you gave and correct me if I'm if I'm misremembering how, how you, how you were teaching this. I, yeah. I don't um, remember. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, cause I remember, cause I was like, yeah, this is eloquently put. So if I'm not putting it eloquently or I'm misquoting you, you can be like, no, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> and that, I, so you've said before that um, a drama is um, uh, we and the character learn the, learn the thematic lesson and then the character succeeds. So we leave the movie learning the lesson, yes. the thematic lesson, and so does the character. A tragedy is we learn the lesson, but the character doesn't, so they fail. So right, we leave right. the movie learning the thematic lesson, but the character leaves the movie either dead or on a worse path than they were before. Mm -hmm. um, so like the mist. A, so no, the, the mist is uh, the or I think the mist is um, I, I nihilism so. is the audience learns the lesson. The character learns the lesson. They do everything right and they still lose. Yes. So nothing matters, yeah. which is parasite. The, yeah. uh, the audience learns the lesson. The characters learn the thematic lesson and the, the characters still lose. And that's because the story is intentionally nihilistic. The, the creators want us to walk away feeling what Jamie said, reality, like that, like nothing matters. You can't do anything. No matter what you do, you're going to lose, which is the mist, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I work in the, you know, I work in the horror genre. I get notes. Some horror movies end up that way. Everybody learns the lesson. They die anyway. And it's like, that's it. That's the end. And it's, it's a choice, especially in the horror, especially in the horror genre. You see it kind of often. So um, I think the subversion here that I'm reading from this, this script, this story mm -hmm. is that nihilism itself is the lesson yes. and the character learns it and we learn it and the character is better off because of it. And the, and the audience is hopefully on board with it and better off because of it. So therefore it's subverting the whole nihilistic approach in a way that, I've never seen. And I think that it's very instructive could, in that could way. Could you rephrase it like it's not the lesson is nihilism, nihilism. The lesson is how to respond to nihilism. Yes, that's yeah. that's that, what that's that, better that, phrased. You know what I mean? Like, because yes. yeah. Wayman's words are essentially the lesson, right? We all don't know what's going on, but please be kind. Be kind. We don't know what's yeah. going on. It's not even necessarily saying anyone's wrong. It's just saying yeah. we don't know what's happening. Please be kind. The only way they've got some. So they've got some quotes. Um, I, if you guys want to interject before I go into their quotes, bounce off of what we just said. Anymore. No, I mean, that's that. So to me, to me, that's like the point. As I was trying to make was I don't necessarily think the lesson is nihilism. Well, I, yeah, I, look, I, 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 I agree. To respond to it. The, the fact. No, that you're no saying... I, 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 bro I, I whittled it down too much. I was trying yeah. to compare the compare the approaches and I, think, I didn't mean that the yeah i think you're right in that it, it kind of subverts it because he uses almost the terminology but yes but the second you say let's be kind and you change and you act kind and you get a victory from it suddenly it's not nihilistic anymore yeah you yes. know what i mean you're acknowledging people's feelings and humans matter that's not nihilism to me at least yeah. you know she she learned a lesson she changed and from the change 
we see the happy results. So to me, that's not nihilistic. You know, it's not all pointless. It didn't so, like, they didn't so, all die or something. So in a way, and maybe I'm, maybe this is recency bias and there's plenty of other examples in cinema that do this that I'm just not aware of, mm -hmm. um, which is most likely, they're recodifying how cinem the cinematic language of what nihilism is. Um, because I've, it, it only ever ends badly in if they're movies not when it's nihilistic it, if they're not recodifying it they're being very unique about it yeah in ways that yeah. we don't often intentionally see. intentionally yeah, intentionally yeah sure. so 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 I, i'm gonna give you three quotes from them about the theme and about their uh about their, their approach so they said they asked themselves whenever they're coming up with theme so this is a good prompt for you like as a, as a listener or and us um what is the big idea the world needs to know that you know and how can you say it in a way that no one else can so that's where they started from those two questions which i think is a great way to approach theme i i know i think i know something you don't know and i want to help you understand something that i think i i have a different perspective on which is positive nihilism um so um they they uh they said the sci-fi film is a classic hero's journey saying that Evelyn's the one and she's going to save the world. The family drama is the actual overall story and it's a positive nihilistic story. The overall film with every step is showing Evelyn that she is less important. She's the worst version of herself until eventually she gets to the rock verse in which she, she doesn't matter. Humanity doesn't matter. Life doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And that's okay. The last act is then trying to convince the character and the audience that maybe despite all that, there is something that matters. There is a way to thrive despite all that. And this is the other quote, and this is basically uh, validating what you said, Bob. Uh, res reconciling um, with infinity is terrifying and overwhelming. What excited us about the film was the impossible challenge of pointing the camera at infinity and making meaning out of it getting the audience to that existential place and making it heartwarming and meaningful. <laughs> I mean, right. damn. Yeah. And I, so. and you know what, uh, Jimmy, that might be something like that's where I'm normally sit in yeah. my life. So I might connect with it better. You right. Know, Cause yeah. I don't believe things. Happen I, I don't find peace in, in, yeah. in, uh, in, uh, nihilism. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I find that it's um, personal. It is personal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I honestly don't think, see, I think if they were teaching us, and this is more a philosophical debate, but it it's is. fun. It really is. It's fun. Yeah. It is fun. But that's I why think, it's good writing, right? Because it makes yeah. you have that debate. I right. We're talking about it at length. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think what the message I got from this movie was, um, see, here's the difference. If the message I got from this movie is, hey, idiot, none of it matters. Uh, then I'd be like, okay, that's nihilistic. But I, the message I get from the movie Hey, we know none of it matters, but guess what? Look around. You got all kinds of gifts around you. Yep. Look at those things. The you things you take, the things that you take for granted are your gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a common theme of movies. Like, yeah, I'm in regret of all these things that are external yep. to me. I didn't make it as a boxer or uh -huh. something, but I'm in love. So I'm happy. It's a very common theme, despite all the headiness of the word nihilism, I think. That's the take I got from it. Because my take was, here's a woman who has lots of regrets, but she has lots of gifts and fruits around her. And if she just pay attention to those, she'd realize that no matter which way her life came out, she'd still need to learn this lesson. That's kind of right. what I took from it. Like, like she's going to be frustrated in any world. In any no matter what. Life, yeah. If she doesn't love the things closest to her. And that... That to me is not a nihilistic message <laughs> at all. Well, I, I mean, it depends on how you I, there's, I get, I get okay. how I get how you could arrive there. Yeah. You know, but it, it is kind of a, a a miracles without God lesson, right? Like there's we're surrounded by miracles. The fact that she exists is a miracle. <laughs> the fact that who she is is a miracle. But it, it there there might be nobody steering the car. Yeah, yeah, but it's okay yeah. if there's nobody steering the it, car. Right? On, on the flip side, it reminds me of like this old thing they used to say at Thanksgiving where it was like the per you probably heard this. This this is a very god, this is a god version of the mm -hmm. same story where it was like the person's swimming in the ocean and they they fell off the boat 
and a helicopter comes by and says, hey, you need help? And they're like, no, no, God's going to save me. And then the other boat comes and they're like, no, God's going to save me. And then the person dies and they meet God. And, th and they're like, I thought you were going to save me. And he's like, I sent a helicopter. It, it reminds me of the same theme. Same thing. It's, it's a different it, theme for, you know, one person might not believe in God, might be nothing happens. In the other but the helicopter is what matters. So it's the point I, or the family matters. I don't know. That's. I also, that's I don't know if this is in your quotes, Jimmy, but um, they, t they talked a lot to extent the stuff I watched. They talked a lot about uh, they didn't want to make a movie about fight makes right. They really wanted. Yeah. They wanted to make an action movie where the the resolution was not about who. Yeah, was we powerful. skimmed past. I got a quote. I got some quotes uh, from the from the the fight stuff that I didn't say. Well, um, they said they said you know we wanted to t to tell the story the same kung fu story in a more healing way. Can we make something like the bride stabbing everyone in Kill Bill as thrilling if Evelyn's weapon of choice was empathy for others' pain? Can we use the genre tools and deliver that dopamine hit when you when John Wick lands five headshots against the bad guy, but instead use connection as the solution instead of violence? So they see, yeah, those quotes. Right. Yeah. And I mean that I think that speaks to what we're talking about right now with the positive mm -hmm. nihilism stuff. Like because it's not because fight uh because might makes right is kind of nihilistic in a way it inherently right? could inherently nihilistic yeah whoever has the most physical power wins is not exactly a spiritual message no and i'm not saying i don't like those <laughs> movies i love big dumb movies but but like the fact that they were actually fighting against that notion to me says right. that it's it, that is sort of an anti-nihilism a bit yeah. like the fact that it's about human emotion and human empathy means yeah. that something does something matters. matters yeah yeah how yeah. you yeah and I, I i you know i skipped past i was gonna put a quote later and this is one of the last quotes i'll use but they're really insightful they kind of tell you what the what they were trying to do um which is uh the we're the next topic at the last topic we're going to compare the drafts and right. i'll i'll just skip to it and we can back up yeah, uh sure. one one major difference it feels a lot like the star wars uh, when we compared the drafts, one major difference um, is that originally it was intended as a classic morality tale. Joe Boo was evil, heavy on the evil, and the story was focused on the classic battle between good versus evil. Then they realized, they said, eventually we realized we wanted to place no moral judgments in this film. We didn't want anyone to be evil. The fact that we exist in this chaos is enough to cause well-intentioned people to hurt each other. The opening is filled with microaggressions, careless racism, careless sexism, careless ageism. It's not because they're bad people. It's because they're being pulled in all different directions and don't have time to look at each other and say, you're a human being who contains multitudes. Once we set that up, the rest of the film is trying to show the audience and main character how important it is to just stop take a moment, look at someone and say, I can see you completely. You contain multitudes. I can connect with you. The only way we're going to survive this chaos is by allowing ourselves that time to, that time to connect with each other every now and then. So that right. speaks to what you're saying. That's that's the lesson. It doesn't really sound like a bunch of nihilist talk. <laughs> no, it's so. So, yeah, no, that you know, doesn't. And that's why doesn't. I think it's interesting that they're saying that's what nihilism is. So, yeah. So I feel that when mm -hmm. I leave the movie, but that doesn't read as nihilism to me is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of where I stand on it. It's like, not, it's not a downer of a movie. Yeah. yeah the theme, not at all. Okay. How about this outside of just like saying like the theme, it doesn't feel bad in the, no, end, it right? feels triumphant. It feels and like progressive and right, beautiful. Right. You're yeah. Not walking out of the mist. It's, no. And I feel movie, right? all of those. I feel that beauty. Right. But I don't yeah, feel yeah. it as a pause as a nihilistic mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a little bit of a, in the moment kind of yeah. thing yeah. message or, you know, love, I also think it's the two of them dealing with how they see there. I, I don't, I I'm going to guess they're probably not spiritual guys. We're going to guess. Yeah. I'm going to guess that. Um, but it's them dealing with how they see everything and also trying to be them, their best selves and then trying to teach us how they do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, the, yeah, the other thing that's yeah. interesting about that draft thing is it sounds like, and this is a common thing writers do, I've done it myself, 
sometimes the theme is found in the second draft or it's found mm-hmm. through writing the first draft. And then you have to go back and do a, a very end to end rewrite with a, sometimes it's a new theme. I usually do my best guess at theme in the first draft, but a lot of times I'll find something else as I write the first draft and then have to go back and change it. Or there's the other end of the spectrum, which is you start with a theme and nothing else. And then that runs the, that's a proceed with caution and runs the danger of your story sounding like a PSA. Like yeah, we're yeah. just filled with monologues of like gun control and, you know, and I'm all I've, for gun control. I'm just saying like, right, you know, right, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I've, I've read scripts where there's like, there's like five different scenes with like three page monologues about the same uh, subject, you know, and it feels right. like a PSA, not a story. Yeah, I've so. never, ever, ever had anything close to that problem. I almost wish I did in some ways. <laughs> I wish I was a little more in that regard. But like, I've never... this doesn't feel like a story. This feels like a it PSA. Should be a movie, it should be a movie first before a message, but having a message is really important. Too. Yeah, it's, it's the missing piece to what makes something just good to great. Right. The the close relative to that is the character driven writer, which there are a lot of character driven writers, but really never quite figure out what the plot is. They just know they want to write about this type of character in this type of world. And they're hoping that's enough. And it happens like that a lot. (laughs) So, and sometimes people make that work. So, so the last thing I did want to talk about, um, and I'll try to breeze through these, but there's a lot of great instructive here and i kind of we do this thing from time to time when we have the information to compare the first draft to the end movie and to show the power of rewriting because your favorite movie started shitty it sucked we it, in we we did this with back to the future the delorean the power, the was power a, plant the yeah and the and the delorean was a water heater and <laughs> <laughs> and just these some of your favorite ideas they didn't they didn't come till three four five six seven drafts sometimes so, they don't come till on being on set even like, right even exactly after. and so this yeah, yeah the, the the rewriting continues into the editing process so there's just it takes a long time they took six years to write this the reason it's so good is because they workshopped the material for six years so um, you can't just write two drafts and think it's done and think it's ready or be upset when it's not ready because it's hard. This is hard. So I wanted to compare the 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 the, the first draft to the last draft. And mm-hmm. uh, I got this material. There's a podcast out there called A Script Apart and the Daniels. So check that out. The Daniels talk for an hour about what the first draft was compared to the last draft. So a lot of this is taken directly from that conversation. Some of it's taken from the uh, commentary too. Um, so, and Jamie and Bob, you guys can speak. I'm going to say the, the thing, and then you can speak to what's instructive about that. Sure. Okay? Yeah. Um, class in session. Um, <laughs> two hours in. <laughs> right, right. Finally. Um, uh, so the first draft was 240 pages. And they okay. said... Quote on this is their quote. It was a 240 page script filled with bad ideas that mostly didn't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, what it, what the first we, we just heard, did the Nope episode and the first cut of Nope was four hours. I remember the Gremlins episode, the first cut of Gremlins was over four hours. So, uh, I mean, they're, they're almost the vomit, what you call them, vomit drafts of the movies or something. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. It's, I, uh, I, 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 you have, it's in there. I'd yeah. be interested to hear their outlining experience, you know, yes. they, because to me, when I hear that, that's probably people that don't outline much that instead jump in and use free the, flow. Just start writing. Yeah, free it's, flow. A, it's essentially their whiteboard, is, is that, you know, that first draft is their yeah. whiteboard. Second, there was a narrator that was intended to be Susan Sarandon, and the twist was going to be that Evelyn in another universe uh, grew up to sound like Susan Sarandon. <laughs> so she was narrating, but you never knew that. Um, and then na- there was narration to thematically and tonally prepare you for the exploration of infinity and explain infinity and chaos thematically as the story unfolded. So... What's instructive about that, Jamie, about getting rid of that? Getting rid of infinity or the voice of, of the narrator? <laughs> the narrator. It's, I mean, 
that's an interesting one in some ways. I reminds me of adaptation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that, they, it almost, they referenced that actually. I, they do. It, yeah, and yeah. I've been meaning. They said it. it was too Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> I, I, that that was another when I watched this. I thought this is kind of a Charlie Kaufman sci-fi movie in some ways. Mm-hmm. It, it, it gives me the same feel. Like when I go see a Charlie Kaufman movie, I'm not sure what I'm in for totally until yeah. I watch it. And this feels like that. Adaptation um, is tonal whiplash for sure. It definitely is. Yeah, it definitely is. But yeah, I I mean, it it really depends on the on the narrator. It that is a that is a choice. I could sort of see that working in this in this mm-hmm. movie. Uh, I mean, I I sort of think it it and especially as a surprise narrator, that's where it would probably yeah. work in some ways. <laughs> and the, like and it, pay, it, and the it fit too. The, the payoff, payoff as a payoff. The whole narrative. But I yeah. also feel like the narration might take away from some of the discovery that the audience yep. gets a lot. Yep, you know? I agree. It it. Yeah. it, it it fills in the gaps too much. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like and, being uh, confused at the beginning. It's right. Like, I think yeah. I think us having to constantly catch up mm-hmm. to an extreme is like you said, Jamie. It gives it energy. It's driving us like, holy mm-hmm. shit, what the hell is happening? Um, yeah. Even just with the family drama. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next one, the opening scene was a classroom explanation of how the multiverse works because they wrote this before. The multiverse was like, like a entrenched thing. in our pop right. culture now. Was, was something your grandma had already seen three movies with uh-huh. the multiverse. Exactly. Yeah. So, 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 and extending from that, the opening sequence was sci fi heavy and never focused on the family. You didn't meet the family for almost 25 pages. And it started as a sci fi movie. Alpha Evelyn, who they reference in this version, in the, in the final version. Alpha Ev- Evelyn was a science teacher drawing a bunch of dots on a board, explaining the multiverse to a room full of students. All the kids laugh at her. She doesn't realize that the dots she's put on the board are in the form of a shape of a penis. So they bury the exposition with the joke, right? Like they right, turned right. the multiverse into a dick joke, which is a great exposition technique. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so uh, yeah, that's a totally different movie because not that's... not only is it start different, but they're they're actually showing the alpha verse, the world of the alpha verse, right? Which they're making this, that the focus in this movie. In the end movie, it's literally just people in a van. Like, yep, that's all we really. It's, get it's broken down to yeah. yeah, people in a van. Yeah, they're the Nebuchadnezzar. Was, yeah, uh, yeah, right, exactly. Right. The Matrix heavy. Yeah. The so, uh, and there's, there's, the there's more. <laughs> Is it, isn't that what the ship's Nebuchadnezzar. called? Nezer. Nebuchadnezzar. It's a, okay. it's a biblical, a biblical name. Yeah. Come okay. on, Jamie. Yeah. Um. So there's, there's two quotes on this to inform this decision, and to your, to, to your uh, reference, Jamie. There's more Matrix stuff in the rest of this coming. Um. Uh. We realize this film only survives the chaos. If the family is always there, we keep, we kept trying to do everything we could to break the rules and do something different, but our real, our rewrites made us realize we had to constantly funnel it all back to the family drama in the early drafts, the sci-fi and action washed out the family story. You kept waiting for the sci-fi movie to come back and you kept waiting for the action to come back. But we realized that approach didn't work because the whole movie at its core is about the family. So, right. Right. Jamie, you've kind of been saying that's why you feel like all of this works, right? Yeah, I I think if this were all the other stuff, I, to me, I that's what would bore me. You know, I, I would just get bored by it. It would just be too much. And I'd really just be judging it based on how funny you know, it was or how much it, it was entertaining me minute to minute. But I, honestly, sometimes I, even to this point, when I kind of criticized it a little bit and said it was it dragged for me a little. It's kind of for that same reason. Like I, I really like seeing these actors act in a drama movie in some yeah. ways. So when yeah. they're on screen together doing relationship stuff, which is the majority of the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. that that is actually my favorite part, as opposed yeah. to like the riffs and the funny stuff, which is very creative and stuff like that. So I would, I totally. You know, also, I'm glad they found that. It reminds yeah. me, thinking of Jamie, it reminds me of, uh, it always reminds me of Endgame, our Endgame episode. Mm-hmm. I feel like that, the movie you're talking about, Jimmy, would be so dense with double mumbo jumbo. Yep. Even if yep. it's real science, it still counts as double mumbo jumbo 
in a script that you're watching for entertainment purposes, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you have to explain everything, and then it would just right. be like, and they do in this, but they, there's some great exposition techniques we're not even going to go into. Right, right. But, but you know what I'm yeah. saying? It would be so dense with that, it would be boring. Trying right. to explain what's going on technically and why right. it works and all uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, because yeah, like like you say, Jimmy, this movie already does have some pretty lengthy exposition things it does, that yeah. they have to do. They do it really fast and really funny and really in a fun way. Yeah. But imagine if they even put like whole other layers of science and right. If they on. were in a Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. <laughs> um if there's now, a if they were, talking about if they were in a theory, Nebuchadnezzar. Theory. If they're yeah. in the Nebuchadnezzar, but it's sorry. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is this is the big change, um, and I think you guys are aware of this. Yeah. And, um, even in the later drafts, this was a father daughter story written for Jackie Chan to the point that the script, the character's name is Jackie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that change led to gender swapping some of the other roles, including uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's role was Desmond was a man. So, you know, that they, they needed to gender swap some of it to balance out like the forces, you know, well, here, here's the interesting thing. So I'm in the midst of a rewrite that's going the opposite direction. It was a, fe a female lead going to a male lead. And what I discovered is it was more interesting to leave a lot of the characterizations the way it is and, and try to find a new model of yeah. male, female. See if think, just swapping the main person changes everything, yeah. I think this script kind of feels that way too because she feels more in some ways masculine, like shut mm -hmm. off her feelings and strict. And, and her husband seems more emotionally in touch and things like right. that it almost um, feels like they didn't really change the characterization like you said yeah like like well they, can, they're, maybe they're going conform... against the grain on what society expects from these stories yeah so it doesn't mean that, yeah yeah and, and it works perfectly it's honest. yeah and it's honest I, yeah it is now, i don't know if the rewrite was that clean uh, you know if they were just I don't able either. to switch but i don't it, either it kind of feels just as somebody that's going through it myself i can kind of see where maybe Maybe it was that way. Maybe it did. It was more, we'll say, you know, gender tropes in some ways mm -hmm. in the yeah, previous right, draft. Right. Yeah. And now this draft, maybe it feels more new and fresh mm -hmm. and alive just by that yeah. gender switch. What a different movie that would have been. Um, the OK, this is this is a small one, but it's it just shows how it's like a script is an onion. And when you change one thing, you often have to change three, four, five, six, seven other things as a response to changing the one thing. Yeah. So, um, and often what I'll read in a rewrite is that a, a writer doesn't anticipate that and they change the one thing and then the other things don't reflect that that big change, you know, that sort of uh, ripple, the rock in the pond is a ripple effect to the whole story. So um, the hot dog universe storyline was about Jackie in another universe in the hot dog verse causing drama at joy's hot dog uh, verse wedding with Becky. And, uh, <laughs> and it, and it built to, you know, so they still had that connection, right. With joy instead of Deirdre. Um, and it built to a, a father daughter dance at the wedding and everybody had hot dog. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's, it just, I, I wanted to speak more to how it's, 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 it's good to be mindful that if you're going to make a big change in, in your rewrite, it often necessitates like a ripple effect of five, six, seven other major elements being changed to reflect that big thing. So um, I guess they, they assume that that kind of would already been taken care of later in the movie. Right. So it's kind of redundant. Yeah. So why not add a, why not add just add name? a little, Oh man, I love it. I love that in another universe, they're lovers. I think it's beautiful. Um, and, and, and what a great contrast to her verse where she has a little bit of, um, conflict with her daughter being gay, you know, and in another, in, in another, another universe, universe, she is with gay. the IRS what a, lady. Right. And what yeah. a great way to gain, to gain insight into what that feels like. Right. So, um, it's just, it's nice premise, premise pretzel right right stretching on, that idea on the other side of, of that coin as as someone who has done this for close to uh, over 20 years at this point who has been writing for over 20 years or something 20 some years um when i sit on the other side of a table and get notes it, it's that mental calculation that's happening i'm literally taking them into buckets like they give yep. me a note and i'm like 
one day note. I could do that in a day. Oh yep. no, that's the one that has the ripples. That's the one that blows things up. That's mm-hmm. the one that tears the pages up. So, <laughs> oh, absolutely, because yeah. you, you're you're thinking of the workload and you're yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well I, said. Well, if, yeah. If you're saying if you change that, then I have to change the entire third act I, now, you're right? Yeah. Like, I've I've gotten real. Let's put it this way: after after 20 years, you two will get really good at immediately recognizing the ones that have ripple effects and the ones that don't. Much much better than the people on the other side of the table. You'll yeah. you'll kind of quickly realize and be able to go back to them and say, "I found that I need to sort of uh, disclaimer that." when I'm making a suggested solution, like an actionable solution to a script yes. problem, yep. I'll, yep. I'll disclaimer, like if you, if this was, if, if you think this will help uh, your execution match your intent, uh, you're also going to have to keep in mind that that's going to change this and this and this. So you're going to have to be uh, on board with all of these changes to your own material um in order to make that work yeah so. it's right. it's yeah. basically the gird your loins uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> like get, get ready for this one <laughs> get ready for this one um okay uh the here's a this is like much like the nope episode the nope episode we uh we learned that the inside of jean jacket the 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 monster scenes were not scripted and they tested and jamie made the assumption and i think it's right that we they the audience didn't understand what what was happening to the people that got beamed up yeah show it yeah so they shot those inside the monster scenes after production was done so the origin of joe boo sequence wasn't scripted they added it after after test screening so that whole sequence where they show how joy became became joe boo none of that was in the script and they tested it and the and the audience didn't understand didn't understand how joy became this thing, this thing you know? right. yeah yeah so they needed that extra little help so it's, i think it speaks to clarity right jamie yeah and that's that's the common type of note you do get after testing is those clarity kind of things i always say the time to be most strict about yourself with clarity is in post-production which you know writers really won't have a chance to do but also in the spec, in the early script phase, I think you should be overly abundantly clear and then let people scale it back. Whittle it down. <laughs> yeah. um, ec- extra strength Tylenol. Find out what will kill me and then pull it back a bit. And I, I think the reasons <laughs> are the same because you're, <laughs> you're, you're getting ready to kind of ship your baby into the unknown world of people reading it cold. Right. So you have to right, extra right. handhold them early because they might, not be in a good mood or something or not be paying attention and you need to extra handhold the mass audiences late so i think there's a there's reason for both and you're trying to see what you can kind of get away with Mm -hmm. but generally i think if you're more generous in the spec screenwriting phase it's probably more in your favor which isn't something really taught to screenwriters it's the opposite a lot of times don't don't dumb it down to your audience well Clarity is really important. And just know that if you're a spec screenwriter, there's going to be a lot of drafts to take it back out. But as a spec screenwriter, sending things in cold, extra clarity, nobody's ever going to say, this sucks. It's too clear. Oh. It's, it didn't need, it didn't need that <laughs> one extra I understand extra beat. what's happening way too much here. <laughs> yeah. well, it, it might be their first note, like you can scale this back. Like after we buy it, just scale this back. But nobody's ever going to say, uh, you know, you went one too many. Uh, that guy, yeah. damn that guy. He he sure tells a clear story. I don't want to hire him. Right. Um, <laughs> okay, I got three more. Um, uh, Joe Boo was originally not related to Evelyn or Jackie or Evelyn. Joe Boo Just was not. Yes. Other person. A completely different. That's character. really different. That's an insanely Very different. different movie. So here's their quote, and then we can talk about what's instructive about that. Uh, we said, whoa, this movie is way too big. What if Joe Boo was the main character's daughter? Then we had an aha moment when we asked, what if instead of good versus evil, it was a complex mother-daughter relationship story? So, or probably That's also be. that also that could be them saying the window thing. What right. if instead of looking at the entire universe through two completely different beings, right? We make it, we a, made it just the family. Yeah, yeah. And often I call uh, often I call that the uh, phony family tree, 
where uh, you know the character these characters from an, from far far away are impossibly closely tied to the main character, so it doesn't ring true. But in this case, it's it's totally organic. They make it work. It t- she's the one, of, so of course her daughter would also have those same powers. Yeah, the reason Evelyn's so, experiencing it is because her daughter is right. Removed. So it, they make right, it all yeah. work. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's not it's not a coincidence because they did that. Right. And, I mean, yeah. th- there is a high level thing when you're outlining or when you're rewriting, always trying to fold characters, ideas back into things you already have is always the magic as opposed to adding another thing or, or expanding. So if you can do that, it's always it's always desirable. And it speaks to the power of that. What if prompt? And how powerful of a tool that is to keep asking those what if questions over and over about what you're working on. I, yeah. I mean, I, I had a real practical, <clears throat> I've, I have another project I'm working on that somebody asked me to fold a character into another. And their, their opinion was it was an independent movie, but a $10 million independent movie. And they said, hiring that extra actor, that could be an extra effect sequence we could get yep. or something. You know, we could do one more cool effect sequence for that. So you can cut your effect sequence or you can find a way to do the same thing, but fold that character into another character. Right. It's two. It's one costume instead of two. It's uh, it's one meal instead of two. I mean, from a production hat, that's a whole different argument. Like I am constantly speaking to that where, you know, instead of having a, you know, five featured extras mm-hmm. who all have one line, you have the same one featured extra who has all five lines, then you're not paying for five costumes. Then you're not paying for five meals. Then you're not paying for five day rates. All of that becomes one expense, but the story and the lines being spoken stay the same. So that's like a whole, yeah. I'm wearing my producer hat right now. Right, but... right, right. <laughs> and you that only have sense. to cast one good actor, you know, Instead and they get more five than people five. who say one line. Exactly. Um, oh my God. I read constantly scripts that have, 16 17 18 featured extras who have like one line and they never show up again it's like ah that's so fucking expensive um <laughs> that's yeah. 14 costumes shit and, and for to what feed. 14 mouths to 14 feed. mouths to feed 14 people to schedule oh what a nightmare make it yeah. one yeah um uh so two more alpha waymond to this point was not an alt waymond he was instead a Morpheus Alphaverse soldier who contacted Jackie slash Evelyn to convince them they were the one. And this is what they said. They said, it was another aha moment. We said, oh, what if the Alphaverse soldier was another version of Waymond? We should have the pushover Waymond become the badass in another universe. And that would be such a fun dynamic to watch on screen. Because the Morpheus character we had was yet another person we were trying to introduce and juggle, and it was just too much for one movie. So there you go, uh, talking about that. A, it was such a different movie, too. Such a different movie. Yeah. You could see where all these notes, though, are kind of the same note in some ways. It's like, bring it closer to the family. Yeah. You Reuse yeah. the family. Don't Consolidation do the- is your friend. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the original version of this, Joy, Joe Boo was not Joy. Uh, Alpha Wayman was not Wayman. I get I <laughs> like get that's the, I, such a different movie, and that speaks to why the family was so not important, not right? important to it. Yeah, I, I get I get why when you're thinking about genre, when you think about genre movies and stuff, especially ones we grew up with or even low budget ones, I get why every time you get the chance to create a new, especially sci fi, new character that comes in, <laughs> they can have their own wacky nature about them or their own spiel, and it's really fun. But then you realize you've made this bloated thing where no, they were nobody has. You know what they did? You know? They did that. They did that exercise and that reason for making it at all. And they refined the premise paint, right? The premise approach and the premise right, delivery. Right. So they gave us those exciting, fun genre characters in a way that is a, yeah. represents the movie, right? It's other versions of, our, of the family of right. the family. So it's great. It's great premise delivery and great, really instructive. Um, so this is the last one. Okay. Um, the everything bagel was a throwaway joke from Joe Boo about nihilism. It was a single joke. Right. And so they said, we wrote all these drafts. I, I love these quotes. Uh, so I saved them for last. 
We wrote all these drafts and knew Joy was struggling with nihilistic thoughts, but we were struggling to come up with dialogue that we liked about nihilism. The bagel came from them brainstorming ways to, to make nihilism visual, because you're always trying to visually represent ideas. Um, sometimes, this, this is so instructive, I think. Sometimes, if complex eye-rolling ideas are packaged as a joke, which we talk about a lot, then you can understand what's being communicated without rolling your eyes at the pretentiousness of the idea. We realized we had a joke and an image that could serve the philosophy of the movie and we didn't have to constantly say what Joe Boo was thinking about nihilism. Once the bagel was established, the bagel spoke for itself. So they took that little joke and they were like, wait, this is it. So... And and they also like you know that sh changed the whole like visual of the whole movie. Right. There's ba there's circles throughout the entire movie. You yeah. Know? You could argue the bagels like the circle of life. You know. <laughs> I yeah I I always used to say like when I really became a film writer in some ways was when I it was out, I was in college in film school, and I was one of those guys we'd be working on a film and I'd be like what if we did this and I it would they'd be jokes right. And I'd just be like, what if we did this? And everybody would laugh and they'd be like, that'd be so funny. That'd be so funny. Let's do it. Let's do a regular way. Let's do it the old way. And then when I realized that those things I was saying were actually good ideas and they were my taste and my voice, that's when I kind of transitioned to becoming a writer. I was like, oh, wait a minute, those ideas are better and they are funny. And, um, and sometimes they work, not always. I mean, some of them are <laughs> shitty ideas, but some of those dumb ideas that you're actually saying that is what writing is, you know? So yeah, sure. the, the everything bagel 20, 19 year old me in film school might've been like, ha ha ha. Okay. Let's do this boring way. But I should have put the everything bagel in the movie. And once I realized I should have at least considered putting the everything bagel in the movie to me, that was my transition from being not a writer to a real writer, because I started to, to think of those things. It, so, it speaks to the no bad ideas theory. No bad ideas. Um, you yep. I always go with put that. it up. I always go with that idea first. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do the other thing. It, you know. Well, I, I, it, it I, I, depends I, on the tone, right? And here it fits. Tone yeah. whiplash movie. You, you, the bagel works. Str strangely enough, I've right. heard on on podcasts not too much unlike our own. Certain very good writers saying, "You know, you should think I've never used those. They always suck or something like that." It it different strokes for different folks. You know right. what I mean? But. I realized that for me, that's what I was adding. That's what I was making people laugh with on set was my <laughs> random, crazy, absurd thinking. Some of them weren't that random or crazy or absurd. And once I realized that, it really helped me kind of also, find a voice, that, maybe. That's usually the stuff that sets you apart from the pack. It does. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's it. Like, that's like it. most people can write ideas that kind of just sit there with everything else <laughs> like it's yeah, not that yeah. hard they're, they're, they're basically yeah. just some version of something we've all already You've seen already seen mm -hmm. right but yes. well, the stuff that yeah the stuff that you can pull out of your mind that only you could pull out of your mind it's you know? it, it's yeah, kind of so. set it's kind of set up and payoff connections and things like that like that's what yeah. i was learning about and i was talking about and people were just kind of like thinking those were the jokes but it took me to realize oh that's the writing that's, that's the writing. The, that's the writing. Yeah. Part. Yeah. I think it speaks to, there's like three big instructive things just from this point, which is like, don't be afraid to brainstorm the, and start with the bad ideas. Cause sometimes the bad ideas are the good ideas or the bad ideas get you to the good idea. Um, but the power of brainstorming and then burying exposition, making exposition visual and burying the exposition with a joke always works, always works. Time also, and time I again. Did, I would also even argue that uh, the everything bagel is a character. Uh, it builds zone, character on Joe Boo. Right. Like Joe, mm -hmm. like the everything bagel actually doesn't mean anything. It's the fact that that character number one knows everything bagels exist, and then decides to you know find her way into the nihilism of the universe through this yeah. for, through her own <laughs> joke herself. You know. Yeah, I think if you were to do the action figure exercise for Joe Boo, it'd be so fun. There would be so many versions of right. her figure. But they would all come with the everything bagel. Um, yeah. <laughs> that would be like, it, you know, she would stand on on her action figure stand would have the everything bagel as like the, you know, the what's behind her in the background. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, she has her own style. She has her own sense of humor in the movie. They yeah. said they said the uh, the uh, the the direction they gave her was um, ev- everyone is in a movie except you, and you think that they're dumb for not understanding that they're in a movie, and you think all of this is dumb. <laughs> and they were that was their note for her perspective for all. <laughs> Right, you're not. You know that that you're in a movie that the rest of the people don't know that they're in. <laughs> that's good. That's great. That's great, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's another. It speaks yeah. to that multiple perspectives in one scene of what's also, happening. Also, it's a performance thing too. Yeah. yeah, and you can feel that, right? Mm-hmm. She's like, ah. yeah. Um, that brings us to the end of all of our points that we wanted to talk yeah. about. I yeah. think so, right, guys? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good episode. Yeah good episode everything. and and once it had everything say, had everything plus it has jimmy's birthday oh uh, like it, it, on top of everything it had jimmy don't birthday. remind me <laughs> <laughs> that's fine um is there anything you guys wanted to plug or anything or tell point people toward before jamie we, uh... you want to plug something uh just again i've been plugging recently it's funny because people listen to this 10 years from 10 now years, right it's i know so it doesn't really matter <laughs> But I am going to be at the Austin Film Festival at the end of October. If anybody's going there, be sure to say hi. I do have like a book announcement pending. Maybe even by the time this podcast will come out, it, I'll be able to announce it. But right now I can't announce it. So I'll just okay. have to tease it. I'll just have to tease a book uh, announcement. Yes. Um, I'll, I will do the same thing, you know, that Jamie didn't say. I'm going to tell you something that's like time sensitive, but like you might be listening to this years later. So who, what does it matter? But uh, um, a film I co-wrote and co-produced it's called WNUF Halloween Special that Jamie also helped write the story on and Bob was involved with as well um, is on Shutter until October 7th and then it's gone. So and then it won't be oh, yeah. streaming anywhere. So that's like three weeks left to see it. Um, it's it'll be in other countries. Uh, there's different dates for when it's gone um, in other. It's in seven, re- seven regions right now. So um, in the other regions, it'll still be available for a couple more weeks. But uh, so if you're an international listener and you have Shutter, you might be able to see it still. But the look, American Shutter is October 7th is the last day for WNF. Uh, lo- lo- lovely Molly fell out of distribution too. Like it's 10 year period or whatever. Man, it was it's up. so weird. You can't, yeah. you can't find it anywhere. Like if you want to yeah. watch it this Halloween, hopefully you have a DVD or something. Yeah. Halloween seasons. WNF Halloween special on Shutter. Check it out. Um, Very cool. Bob, do you want to tease what we're doing next? I think it'll be fun to tease what we're doing next, which is. If you want to, sure. Yeah. 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 We're going to do, we, we've sort of, we can't we started doing this uh we did it with candy man we did it with ghostbusters um sort of did it with speed sort of speed all um, at once it, all at once speed was everything <laughs> everywhere all all at speed once. was yes that was yes um the we're gonna we're gonna compare the original hellraiser we're gonna we're gonna do an episode on the original hellraiser and then we're gonna ep- do a, an episode on the new hellraiser so that should be fun i'm i'm looking forward to that i love right. Hellraiser. I I feel like we should put some weird secret thing to see if anybody makes it this far in the podcast. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Some Easter egg that they have like to tag, it, come... well, tag us on Twitter with this or something. Yeah, yeah. That it feels like to make it this far. If anybody actually, hears, I mean, damn, it's like about. yeah, tag, two tag hours. All, tag all of us and say I made it that far. And then, yeah, like, that, yeah. I, I survived. Yeah. I survived the everything, everywhere, everywhere all, at, all once. at once. Writers blockbusters. That, I, I don't know that that fits on Twitter. That's too many characters. <laughs> I, I bet you two people will do it. That's my bet. Two okay, I, I'm curious. I'm curious yeah, if we'll ever if we'll ever see anybody that we have. We haven't been doing the bingo, but we've. Uh, it's just because it would just be nonstop us saying bingo. Uh, yeah, same, yeah but that's the same joke repeated <laughs> nine thousand times. Yeah, every, yeah. every episode's a winner. At this quickly. point, at this point, yeah, that's just the personality of the show. Those bingo card, uh, Michael Rusk's Michael Rusk, yes. his bingo card is just the personality of us. So. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. with that, uh, that's everything. Yeah. Everywhere, all at once. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye. You have just listened to Writer's Blockbuster, a screenwriting podcast featuring two professionals and another guy. Available only on Thundergrunt. <laughs>